Good morning, everyone. This is the clerk with a courtesy announcement that this meeting is now being streamed live on the Internet. Good morning, Mikkel. Good morning, Eureka. Good morning, how are you? I'm good, how are you? I'm doing well, thank you. Good morning, James. Good morning. Have a great meeting. Thank you. Good morning, Sheriff Smith. Good morning. Thank you, Rhonda. You are welcome. Have a great meeting. Hello, Rhonda. Hello. Good morning, Supervisor Chavez. Good morning, Rhonda. Have a great meeting. Thank you. It looks like you are three for five. Recording in progress. Rhonda, I see Supervisor Chavez. I know we don't have Vice President Ellenberg. We are also missing Supervisor Samidian. Okay. I need to find a way to increase my screen size to see who everybody on here. Perhaps. Waiting for one more supervisor, and then we'll start today's meeting.
Um, Supervisor Samidian has just entered the building. He should be online shortly. Thank you very much. And I just got words because Sumidian is connecting. Well, I hope everyone had a nice Valentine's Day yesterday. Competitive Super Bowl. Did you have a team there, Mike? My wife and her whole family are Rams fans. So we've been at odds for about 40 years with Rams and 49ers. But I had uh, several nephews and cousins at the games, at the game. And they sent us pictures afterwards. So they were very happy. So I was happy. I was happy for my side of the family. <laughs> still, still Raiders and Niners for me, but yep. happy family. That's always what counts. Exactly. Rhonda, do you see Supervisor Samidian yet? I don't. I do not, sir. I see Supervisor Lee. I have to say that is a beautiful new background, Supervisor Lee. Thank you. It's our proud, one of our proud parks of Santa Clara County at Levin which of course also just so happened in District 3. <laughs> <laughs> well done, well done. Great job to the photographer. It is a beautiful picture. It really is. Maybe one of these days I'll have my meeting there and so make it a real background. <laughs> I think what we'll do, we'll give Supervisor Sumidian, who just got on. There we go. Nice to see you, Supervisor. All right. Rhonda, thank you very much. We're now going to turn to Dave for our roll call. Good morning, Supervisor Lee. Good morning, present. Supervisor Chavez. Here. Supervisor Sumidian. Here. Vice President Ellenberg is absent. And President Wasserman. Here as well. Thank you thank very you. much. We now move on to item number two, which is our Pledge of Allegiance. And for the first time in two years, to go along with the state of the county, I'm going to lead the Pledge of Allegiance. If you can please all rise and face the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag, the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. We now move on to item number three, which is the invocation. Today's invocation is going to be given by Dr. Travis D. Boyce, who is chair of the Department of African American Studies 
at San Jose State University. Go Spartans! Dr. Boyce holds a BA in history from Claflin University, as well as an MA in history and PhD in cultural studies from Ohio University. His areas of research expertise and interests are 20th century African-American history and popular culture. He is co-editor of Historicizing Fear, published by University Press of Colorado in 2020, which looks at how fear of the other throughout human history has been used as a tool to oppress groups. Dr. Boyce's work has appeared in edited collections such as Campus Uprisings, Understanding Injustice and Resistance Movements on College Campuses, Racism and Discrimination in the Sporting World, Documenting the Black Experience, Essays on African American History, Culture and Identity in Nonfiction Films and Before Obama, a reappraisal of Black Reconstruction. Era politicians, as well as the journals, The Radical Teacher in Present Tense, a journal of rhetoric in society, among others. He is the Black African American Studies Area Chair for the Southwest Popular American Cultural Association <clears throat> and a member of the editorial board for the Fashion, Style, and Popular Culture Journal a peer-reviewed journal specifically dedicated to the area of fashion scholarship and its interfacings with popular culture. Dr. Boyce also has served as a guest editor for special issues for the Journal of Asia Pacific Pop Culture, Fashion, Style, and Popular Culture Journal, and contributed a guest editorial essay, Cruel Summer, for the dialogue the Interdisciplinary Journal of Popular Culture and Pedagogy. I have to look that one up. Dr. Boyce is presently finishing a book project titled Steady and Measured, Benner C. Turner, an African-American college president in the segregated South, 1950 to 1967. And with that introduction, Dr. Bright, Dr. Boyce, it's your turn. Good morning. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. President Wasserman. Um, I'm glad to be here again. Second, first of all, um, this is my second year here at San Jose State University, uh, as well as in the Bay Area. And I wanted to just use just a few moments to talk about Black History Month. Um, and I wanted to uh, talk about specifically uh, this a topic that looks at our current state of America um, in relationship to this history. And there's a piece I've uh, submitted to the SF Chronicle. It may get published, it may not get published, but in the event it does get published uh, or doesn't get published, I hope today's um, meeting memorializes my words. And I wanna speak briefly on this topic called what is truth? Birth of a Nation and Black History Month 2022. So on February 8, 1915, approximately 107 years ago, a controversial film called Birth of a Nation was released. Based on Thomas Dixon's 1905 novel, The Klansman, a historical romance of, Klu of the Ku Klux Klan, the film was thematically rooted in white supremacy, anti-Black racism, and the Lost Cause movement. The Lost Cause is a revisionist version of US history that glorifies the Confederacy. It also dismisses the idea that slavery was a cause of the American Civil War. The film centers on the Camerons, a prosperous slave-holding family in the fictional town of Piedmont, South Carolina, before, during, and after the American Civil War. In the story, the Camerons become destitute after the war, during a period called Reconstruction. They and the white South in general ultimately found redemption after the fall of Reconstruction with the assistance of the Ku Klux Klan. You can watch this film on YouTube and it's over three hours long, just as a, a warning. The most compelling part of the film is the second part half, the post-Reconstruction, post-Civil War era or the Reconstruction era. During this period in reality, 
the American South was occupied by US federal troops and slavery was outlawed. African-Americans gained the right to vote and were unprecedentedly elected to state, local and national office, offices. One of the lasting legacies of Reconstruction, according to W.E.B. Du Bois's Black Reconstruction America, under Black America rule was the establishment of universal public education. But Birth of a Nation misrepresented this progress. Instead, the film portrays Black Americans as lazy, corrupt, violent, rapists, and incapable of self-governing. Conversely, the Ku Klux Klan were portrayed as the heroes who overturned Reconstruction, Black rule, reestablishing civilization under divine providence. Birth of a Nation was a, considered a cinematic masterpiece, even endorsed by a sitting US president, which at the time was Woodrow Wilson, who noted that the film was like, like writing history with lightning. The film amplified racial violence throughout the country, which was already in the period of low point in racial relations. This includes a successful campaign in erecting Confederate monuments, voter suppression, anti-Black racial violence, and lynchings and racial segregation. The film even was even a central political issue in uh, the Ohio gubernatorial uh, race uh, in the early 20th century, as well as influential in the revitalization of the Ku Klux Klan in the early 20th century. Most disturbingly, Birth of a Nation reinforced a revisionist historical narrative that consequently influenced curriculum in public schools in America and the South designed to erase any history of African-American progress and ensure white domination. Many Americans accepted the film as truth. A recorded interview is accessible on YouTube as well called D.W. Griffith Interview on Birth of a Nation. In the interview, Griffith recounts in his childhood that he listened to his father's service, uh, listened to his father's service uh, as a Confederate officer during the Civil War. He remembered his mother sewing robes for the Ku Klux Klan. When asked in the interview if historical events surrounding the plot of, 19, of the 1915 15 film was true, Griffith responded, what is the truth? Today, there are similar attempts being made to change the past as truth through new restrictions put on public education to suppress the teaching of race and particularly African-American uh, history. As the chair of African-American studies at San Jose State University, I am opposed to these new restrictions and attacks on African-American history. Such rules undermine black history and chisel away the foundation of our nation. I strongly advocate for teaching truth when it is based on historical and empirical evidence, not selective, one that is inclusive of, full African, of the full African-American experience, one that debunks the revisionist history. This year's Black History Month should serve as a rebuttal to that 1915 film, Birth of a Nation. In wake of our current national discourse surrounding the teaching of race in schools, Okay, yeah, sorry. In wake of, uh, in, in wake of our, our current national discourse around teaching race in public schools. As accurate as historical dramas may appear, birth of a nation should not serve as a substitute. Thank you very much, everyone. And Dr. Boyce, thank you very, very much. And uh, welcome to San Jose State and our community. Absolutely. Glad, thank you, glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you. We're now going to move on to item number four, which is State of the County. As president of the Santa Clara County Board of Supervisors, it is my privilege to give this year's State of the County with my esteemed colleagues, Vice President Ellenberg, Supervisor Chavez, Supervisor Lee, and Supervisor Simidio. I'm a numbers guy, so when thinking about what to focus on today, my mind naturally went to figures, data, benchmarks, and other measurements. Because numbers tell a story, they tell the story of who we are, what we do, and what we value. In a word, our job is to serve, and we serve a lot of people. As the sixth largest county in California, our organization employs 22,000 individuals 
in more than 70 agencies and departments. Our work is to provide essential services to a diverse population of almost 2 million people. To put that in perspective, 14 states have fewer than 2 million people living in them. Our ability to serve is heavily impacted by changes in the economy and changes to state and federal policies and funding. The vast majority of the county's $9.2 billion budget uses restricted federal and state pass-through revenues to provide mandated services. For the past two years, the pandemic has presented extraordinarily unique and dramatic funding challenges, such as the sobering news we received last week from County Executive Dr. Smith during the mid-year budget review. The staggering cost of the COVID response is a huge problem. Today, the county has spent more than $1.3 billion, and we could surpass $1.5 billion by the end of fiscal year 22, just four and a half months from now. At the same time, FEMA reimbursements are coming in slower than anticipated. This makes balancing this year's budget tougher than ever, but as always, we will find a way. We will explore options for balancing a budget that keeps the needs of our residents in the forefront. On the positive side, the assessment roll grew 4.6% in 2021. As we know, these tax dollars are what pay for local schools as well as city and county services. But it is not enough for us to simply provide services. This board and all our county employees work every day to promote a safe and healthy community for all. And this work garners national attention and state recognition every year. In 2021, our county was nationally recognized with the Distinguished Budget Presentation Award for budget transparency by the National Government Finance Officers Association. And two county programs were recipients of CSAC Challenge Awards, the Voluntary Vendor Cost Reduction Initiative and the SSA Voice Videocast. These awards are a testament of our employees' ingenuity and abilities to perform under pressure. And the pressure of the last two years has been tremendous and relentless. As the provider of safety net services for our county residents, we see the demands for help have skyrocketed. Homelessness, for instance, for those who are unhoused, it is literally a matter of life and death. And it begs the question, why? Why are there so many unhoused people living in wealthy Silicon Valley? The answer is complicated, but the solution is more straightforward. The solution to homelessness is housing. Housing with case management and supportive wraparound services. People who are unhoused have both short-term and long-term needs, which the county, cities, and nonprofit partners work collectively to meet. The county's Office of Supportive Housing is doing a phenomenal job of working with regional partners to increase the supply of housing, housing that is affordable and available to extremely low income and special need households. Thanks to the $950 million Measure A affordable housing bond, we are on track to add 4,441 new affordable units to the housing inventory by 2025, enough for 13,000 people we are now more than 60% of the way towards our 10-year goal in just four years. At the same time, we are also investing in the services that are needed to support the newly housed. As the largest public service provider in the region, the county is constantly working to connect people with the life-saving behavioral health services we offer, including mental health, urgent care, emergency psychiatric services, suicide prevention and crisis, mobile crisis response, 
residential continuum of care and substance use treatment services for adults and youth. And this is just a short list. Roughly half of the county's budget is dedicated to health services. When someone experiencing a mental health crisis or drug addiction enters a county facility, whether it is a county emergency room or a county park, we connect them with the services they need. The mental health and substance abuse challenges we are facing as a county are equally pervasive throughout our incarcerated populations. This underscores the need to both increase behavioral health services in our jails as well as in our community. These investments will increase the odds of expedited rehabilitation and reduced recidivism. To put it plainly, these investments will help people. Public safety, substance abuse, and behavioral health care needs will continue to be county priorities in 2022. While we continue to provide countless other services, such as VMC, fire, ambulance, regional interoperability, assessor, clerk recorder, district attorney, public defender, airports, roads, parks and trails, tax collector, animal services, and the library system, just to name a few. And speaking of animal services and library systems, each has received national honors. In fact, our county library system was voted among the nation's top five in the last 60 days. The county has been providing fundamental services for more than 170 years and doing a great job thanks to its employees, even after a deadly virus came to the Valley of Heart's Delight. The first reported case of COVID-19 in our county occurred on January 31st, 2020, more than two years ago. Soon after the virus began to appear far and wide, but spreading even faster was fear and uncertainty, which penetrated deep into the collective consciousness. Many argue that the health, economic, and mental toll of this pandemic will define a generation. Time will tell. But in the face of fear and uncertainty, our county continues to address each new challenge as it comes. The county health system employs more than 9,400 workers which, who provide services for 900,000 outpatient visits each year. And that was before COVID-19. To meet pandemic demands in clinics, hospitals, call centers, and more, the county invoked a little known provision of the state constitution, which reads as follows. It is hereby declared that the protection of the health and safety and preservation of the lives and property of the people of the state from the effects of natural, man-made, or war-caused emergencies, which result in conditions of disaster, that all public employees are hereby declared to be disaster service workers, subject to such disaster service activities as may be assigned to them by their superiors or by law. Since March of 2020, more than 4,800 county employees, that's more than one in three non-health system workers, have been deployed as disaster service workers to support pandemic response efforts. These county employees had to put their careers on hold to join forces with the existing 9,400 health service employees to serve in brand new frontline roles. To put this in perspective, imagine going to work on a Monday as a management analyst. You work on a team with your coworkers to draft and analyze budget documents, all while sitting at a desk in your cubicle. A job you were hired to perform. Now imagine going to work on a Tuesday to discover that you have been activated 
as a disaster service worker, a DSW. You are then deployed and report to a new supervisor with new coworkers at a new location, perhaps picking up un unhoused people from downtown and driving them to motels or working at a testing or vaccination site. Meanwhile, the county employees who are not deployed are not only performing their own jobs, but they are also asked to do the jobs of their deployed coworkers. In no small terms, our county workforce was asked to step up, and they did, and they continue to do so. For that, everyone is grateful. County residents are grateful. County staff are grateful. Your families are grateful. And we, the County Board of Supervisors, thank you. It is also worth noting that the county's emergency operations center built an entire crisis response almost overnight. Most government planning is carefully orchestrated over the course of months and years, not days and weeks. The scope and scale of the work performed was and still is immense, to say the least. Mass vaccination and mobile sites had to be located, secured, staffed, and publicized. Mobile vaccination units seek out the most vulnerable communities and bring services to them. 1,000 pop-up clinic days have been performed at community centers, schools, churches, long-term care facilities, work sites, and senior centers throughout the county. Outreach is conducted in five languages and distributed through a variety of culturally effective means. Door-to-door -door teams of healthcare workers and promotoras have knocked on 319,000 doors in the highest risk areas in the county. Not 319,000 phone calls or emails sent, but 319 physical attempts to reach people. The same teams have also made 48,000 in-person contacts with businesses. These efforts connect people to information and services, including testing and vaccinations. Since the pandemic started, the county health system has provided more than 1.6 million COVID-19 tests and 1.5 million doses of COVID-19 vaccine. And what is the result? Santa Clara County leads all large counties in the nation with more than 91% of its residents ages five years and older vaccinated and leads our region in booster shots. This has helped keep our case counts lower than most counties our size and deaths lower than the state average. I want to thank all the county employees who have dedicated themselves to the cause for the past two years. Your work is appreciated and your efforts have saved so many lives. Those who know me know that I'm a cup is half full kind of guy. So I expect to receive to see a return to normalcy in 2022 for our workforce and for our residents. 2022 is my 20th and final year of public service, and I look forward to working with my colleagues on the board, our county staff, and the community as we continue to navigate these uncharted waters and whatever else may come our way. Hall of Fame baseball player and philosopher Yogi Berra said it best when he said, it's tough to make predictions, especially about the future. <laughs> While none of us can know exactly what the future will bring, I do know that Santa Clara County will take on all challenges head on with grit and determination, with compassion and intelligence. Just a few of the reasons I call Santa Clara County the best there is. Thank you for tuning in. And now let's return to the agenda. Item number five. Thank you. We are now going to announce adjournments in memoriam. 5A, Supervisor Simidian will go first. 
and uh, and second, Supervisor Smitty. Thank you, uh, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, and um, thank you for your remarks. Uh, it's my privilege, sad though it be, to uh, ask our board today to adjourn in memory of uh, two really exceptional individuals who lived lives that were very, very full indeed. Uh, the first is our friend Jay Jackman. Uh, Jay passed away uh, just last month. Um, just a gentle, decent soul uh, whose quiet affability, frankly, masked an extraordinary mind. Uh, he was a Harvard graduate who attended uh, Columbia Medical, uh, Medical School, uh, did his psychiatric residence at, uh, at Stanford, um, and, and yet wore his uh, accomplishments and credentials uh, very, very uh, quietly, as I say. Um, and uh, he was really fascinated uh, both uh, in his professional life and his personal life and just what made people tick and, and what he could do to help them uh, find a path out of their troubles. Uh, after his residency uh, at Stanford all those years ago, he um, ran a drug treatment program in San Francisco for a while, uh, moved to Hawaii, uh, married his first wife there, had uh, three kids who uh, are uh, among the joys of his life, obviously. Uh, and then um, ultimately in 1990, uh, Jay married the love of his life, uh, Myra Strober, who uh, those of you who know Myra know she is um, an extraordinary person uh, in her own right. And uh, these two were uh, quite, a, quite a pair together all those years. Uh, in eulogizing Jay, Myra uh, offered up a quote uh, from Deuteronomy that, uh, the book of Deuteronomy, that uh, she felt um, really encapsulated uh, Jay's way of walking through life, and that was justice. Justice shall you pursue. And that's really uh, what guided Jay in his, uh, his work, his life, his um, uh, seemingly every waking hour uh, was the pursuit of justice. Uh, he uh, had a very giving heart in uh, both his personal and professional and public service life, uh, did a stint as trustee at the Foothill De Anza College, which was among uh, the most satisfying uh, of experiences in his view. He was an active partisan, uh, uh, a Democrat who, um, served on the Democratic Central Committee, uh, but both the county level and at the state level, representing uh, the Congresswoman from uh, our area, Anna Eshoo. He uh, uh, was a mainstay of the Peninsula Democratic Coalition. And, it, you know, he, um, he did the work and he thought it was important that everybody roll up their sleeves and do the work. Uh, I, I, uh, I remember people would be surprised when he would say, no, he actually, liked registering new voters. He liked precinct walking. Uh, to him, that human connection uh, in the pursuit of justice was um, sort of what made it real and tangible. And uh, with a, a curious mind and a desire to help in other ways, uh, at the age of 60, Jay went back to law school, uh, uh, to, uh, or went back to school at law school at Hastings uh, where he was, uh, as you might expect, the oldest in his class, uh, but certainly uh, young at heart, uh, got his law degree and then uh, ended up as an expert witness uh, uh, in probably 250 murder cases across the country. Uh, so we uh, take a minute today to reflect on a, a life of extraordinary generosity and goodwill. Uh, and we send our condolences, of course, to uh, his wife, Myra Strober, and uh, the kids and the uh, stepkids and the extended family. And it is my privilege truly uh, to ask our board to adjourn in Jay's memory today. I also have the uh, sad privilege of asking that we adjourn in uh, memory of uh, Leonard Ware, Leo Ware. Uh, Leo was one of those larger than life folks who uh, come along and uh, you just you're just always mindful of their presence, uh, not because they dominate, but because they are just so uh, 
um, larger than life, just larger than life is the way I always thought of Leo. Leo passed away in December at the age of 93. Uh, he had uh, a long struggle, but he had his wife of 62 years, uh, Jean Ware, with him. Uh, and uh, that was an extraordinary full 93 uh, years, as I say. Uh, Leo was born uh, up in Washington State uh, back in the late 1920s. Uh, during the early days of his uh, legal career uh, in the 1950s, he was an assistant U.S. attorney in Seattle, uh, where he prosecuted both criminal and civil matters. Uh, in the mid-60s, uh, he recruited other lawyers to go with him to Mississippi to register Black voters. And um, I heard him talk about that uh, only a few times, but it was clearly an experience that uh, reinforced his views on the need for strong enforcement of civil rights laws. He, um, he was a founding partner of a firm called Ware Fletcher and Friedenrich, which was uh, one of the first firms in the late 1960s to uh, step up and serve the uh, newly emerging tech uh, community, business community here in the peninsula in the South Bay. Uh, and they had, a, at Ware Fletcher Friedenrich, they had a very, um, a clear notion about the caliber of the services they were going to provide and the fact that folks in our region uh, shouldn't have to look to San Francisco for top-notch service uh, and they developed a, a reputation uh, that was really uh, quite extraordinary. Ultimately, uh, through a series of several mergers, became part of the firm named DL A. Piper, a global firm with more than 4,000 lawyers. So. Um, he, he really did. He, um, but he gave back in other ways. Uh, he was one of the, uh, he and Gene were uh, among the first 15 shareholders for uh, Embarcadero Media, which uh, created the Palo Alto Weekly and the Menlo Park Almanac and the Mountain View Voice. And um, this is how we have gotten our news and uh, built a sense of community in the North County and South San Mateo County for, uh, gosh, 40 years now. Uh, he was also a founder and original board member of the Universal, excuse me, University National Bank and Trust. I, uh, I should be able to say that because I, uh, I remember well as a customer of University National Bank and Trust the piles of Walla Walla onions that were available to uh, depositors uh, every season uh, that lent a particular aroma, as uh, Leo would have put it, uh, to uh, to the bank. Um, he supported a host of nonprofits, most uh, probably perhaps East Side Prep in East Palo Alto and the Peninsula Open Space Trust. Uh, got a ranch down in Morgan Hill, Supervisor uh, Wasserman, so uh, a connection there as well. And um, he just, as I say, was uh, always, uh, in my estimation, a little bit larger than life. And our, our uh, county and, and community are smaller uh, without him. So our sympathies uh, to uh, Gene and the family, and we uh, thank uh, all of these good people for the contributions they've made to our county over the years. Uh, some uh, may be quiet, uh, some more readily visible, but um, people who made this place the place that it is. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I thank you, colleagues. Thank you, Supervisor Sumidian. Now move on to Supervisor Lee for 5C. Thank you, uh, President Wasserman. Today, we're also closing um, our German in memoriam of uh, Mr. John Arriaga Sr. Uh, John Arriaga was born back in April 3rd, 1937 in Englewood, California, and passed away January 24th at the age of 84. He attended Stanford University on a basketball scholarship and was a legendary real estate developer and generous philanthropist and devoted his financial resources to projects across the Stanford campus and Silicon Valley. Currently, quite a few buildings on the campus bear his family name, and many other contributions also went to athletic facilities, to graduate student housing, as well as to a broad range of programs supporting undergraduate and graduate students with many scholarships. He was a humble man and often worked directly with university staff to make things happen. In 2009, he was awarded the degree of Uncommon Man, Stanford's highest honor for service to the university. Most of John's professional success started alongside his partner in business, Richard Peary. When they started back in the 60s, 
purchasing farmland, converting to office spaces to help provide the needed space for so many startup technologies mm -hmm. and semiconductor businesses. And this is when most of us would still call Silicon Valley the Valley of the Heart's Delight. John survived by his wife, Gioia Fasi Ariaga, two sisters, Alice and Mary, and his brother, William. His daughter, Laura, and her husband, Mark Andreessen, and their son, John Jr., and wife, Justine, and four grandsons. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Lee. That concludes our adjournments in memoriam. We're gonna move on to item six. I've got a proclamation to present on um, behalf of Vice President Ellenberg, who's not here at this time. I'll do that. And then after that is public comments. Anyone wishing to speak about anything not on today's agenda, please register your hand electronically so we can get an idea of how many people and how much time to allocate. This is a February 15th, 2022 proclamation, African Ancestry History, Health and Heritage Month. It is my honor to present this proclamation on behalf of the Board of Supervisors in honor of African American Health and Heritage Month. Accepting this proclamation today will be Alma Burel, a co-chair for the Black Leadership Kitchen Cabinet of Silicon Valley. And I'm looking to see if we have Alma on. Dave, do we have Alma available on today? I'll continue reading this. The Black Leadership Kitchen Cabinet, the BLKC of Santa Clara County, was established in 2005 with a mission to promote and establish initiatives, programs, policies, and legislative reforms that improve the overall well-being of the county's African, African ancestry community. In 2014, the BLKC partnered with the county's public health department to identify the root causes of the poor health outcomes many individuals in our, outcome, in our community were experiencing. The 18-month-long qualitative assessment produced rich data from a large cross-section of the community. Community members candidly reported their experience with our healthcare systems and offered strategies to improve and encourage structural and systemic changes that will improve overall health outcomes. One important strategy that was identified calls for establishing an annual African African Ancestry Health Month celebration in conjunction with Black History Month in February. This celebration of health offers an opportunity for government agencies, healthcare providers, community-based organizations, and African African Ancestry Health consumers to come together to promote the health and well-being of this community. While sharing information and resources and building relationships that contribute to optimal health for African African ancestry residents throughout Santa Clara County. I wanna thank the BLKC for their leadership, as well as the dozen or so other agencies and organizations in our community that direct their efforts toward improving all aspects of the quality and health and life for the 60,000 plus African and African ancestry residents that call this county their home. We are all richer for their contributions and civic participation. It is my pleasure to welcome and introduce Alma Burrell, the co-chair for the Black Leadership Kitchen Cabinet of Silicon Valley. Alma, would you like to say a few words? Yes, good morning. Thank you, Supervisor Wasserman. Good morning. I just wanted to say on behalf of the Black Leadership Kitchen Cabinet that we appreciate the board providing uh, presenting this proclamation to us in honor of African African Ancestry Health and he Health and Heritage Month. Also, would just remind everyone that this is a direct result of a collaboration partnership with the Board of Supervisors back in 2014, where the the Board of Supervisors. Uh, helped to fund a health assessment of the African African ancestry community. Um, and from this health assessment, this was one of the strategies that the community wanted to uh, have annually to honor our health and heritage. You, all of their contributions are very much appreciated. As we all know, uh, Roots Community Health Center expanded to the um, 
South County to Santa Clara County as a result of that partnership. So I'm just on, um, I'm here on behalf of everyone to say thank you. And we look forward to continued partnership, honoring and promoting the health of all of our African, African ancestry population in Santa Clara County. Thank you. Thank you, Alma, appreciate it. We now move on to item num number seven, which is public comment, which like I said, is the opportunity for anyone who wishes to speak on anything not on today's agenda. And as I look at the little font on my screen, we are going to have one minute each, Dave. If you can please start that now. Everybody Will do, thank you, Mr. President. One moment, please. Thank you. And everybody remember this is the opportunity to speak on items not on today's agenda. The first speaker is Tessa Woodmancy. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Well, it's disappointing to only have one minute. However, I am proud of the Santa Clara County uh, Board of Supervisors for providing public comment at the beginning of the meeting. And because um, both um, uh, Cindy Chavez and my son, Marshall Woodman C., who is running for mayor, it's very important. Marshall is running on a platform of keep Santa Clara, make Santa, make San Jose a food garden again and keep fossil fuels in the ground. And because of this, you know, I just wanted to recognize Santa Clara County Board of Supervisors for their, you know, having a very good meeting. First of all, your, 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 state of the county was put into your agenda, that's beautiful, and that our public comment is in the beginning of the meeting. So in, in, in conclusion, making San, San Jose a food garden again, and Santa Clara Valley into the future, and the state of California a food garden again, is a leadership, and keeping fossil fuels in the ground. This has to be our motion going forward. Next speaker is Paul Soto. You have one minute. Please go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Paul seems to have dropped off. Next speaker is Rhoda Fry. Rhoda, you have one minute. Please go ahead. Hi, good morning. First, I'm not talking about item 13. The Lehigh Permanente cement plant and quarry have been substantially idle for two years now. So guess what? The Bay Area has not imploded without having a local supply of cement. But listen, it's time for the quarry to be reclaimed in earnest. The Service Mining and Reclamation Act, for which the county is lead agency, requires that reclamation happen concurrently. We've got dust that's coming from the quarry. It can fly four miles and it is hazardous to human health. Please, let's get this reclamation going. The other thing that impacts reclamation is the by default permission to run a new aggregate plant at Lehigh. And I would ask the county to please not allow that to continue so that Reclamation can happen in earnest according to the 2012 approved plan. Thank you very much. Thank you. And David, before you move on, yes. Um, although Rhoda said not about the uh, plant, that was clearly about the plant. We, the reason we're at one minute is we have more than 30 speakers that have registered so far. So that's what we're doing. And if you choose to speak about an item on the agenda, I will interrupt because we need to do this um, as it's laid out. Thank you, David. Thank you. Going back to Paul Soto, you have one minute. You've been unmuted. Please go ahead. Uh, good morning, uh, Supervisor Paul Soto from Ocean. Um, Dr. Boyce talked about uh, truth. And I think that from a different perspective that what Birth of a Nation told was the truth. It was the truth about the perceptions and the thinking and the mentality of the Anglo-American. That's what it did. It told the truth about the way they think, about what they value, about who they are as a people. And we have dealt with that infection for a long, long time. Because when we came into contact with the Anglo, we became sick. Our minds became sick. Our bodies became sick. Our elders died. Think about that. Next speaker is Stacy Laris. You have one minute. Please go ahead. Hello. I wish that we did have more than one minute. I'm calling in to just discuss 
uh, this whole Corona Palooza baloney and you guys sitting here talking about vaccinations when they're not vaccinations, they're poison shots, they're exper experimental gene therapy and going around to people's homes. Are you guys kidding me? Are you crazy? What is this? You clearly do not care about anybody's health. This is not about health and the state of emergency. We're not in an emergency for two years, you guys. Get a grip. This is about money and it is crystal clear. I, I never comply, I never consent, I never will. And you guys just need to stop. You're criminals, you should all be behind bars and you will be, Nuremberg 2.0. What are you doing? Do you not have a moral compass? Any of you? Do you not have hearts or souls? People have lost their jobs and their lives. Stop this. End the madness now. Next speaker is Michelle Liu. You have one minute. Please go ahead. Good morning. I'm Michelle Liu, CEO of the Health Trust. And we want to thank Dr. Sarah Cody for extending the mask mandate. As a provider of Meals on Wheels and other social services, we really appreciate the County of Santa Clara following science and aligning our actions with public health values. With health equity in mind, please stay the course. You are saving lives and we thank you. Next speaker is Robert Brownstein. You have one minute, please go ahead. Good morning. Um... I'm speaking as a senior citizen uh, this morning, and I would just like to thank the Board of Supervisors, county staff, and particularly the health officer, Sarah Cody, for putting the lives of elderly people and immunocompromised people first. Keep up the good work, keep the vaccination programs, keep testing, keep the mask programs, do things that help control the virus and prevent people from dying unnecessarily. The data is in that shows the incredible effectiveness of what you're doing. Thousands of people are alive today in Santa Clara County because we took better measures and stronger measures than in other parts of the country. And a lot of those people who are alive today who wouldn't otherwise have been alive are immunocompromised and elderly. Thanks again, life is worth it. Next speaker is Linda Edwards. You have one minute, please go ahead. Linda, are you there? Good morning, everyone. My name is Linda Edwards. I'm with the Common Sense to Save Our County Coalition. I live in Bowdoin District 3. For two years, we have been subjected to your lockdowns and mandates, which have negatively impacted our day-to-day -day lives in numerous ways. Countless people in our county have lost their jobs as a direct result of your mandates. Businesses have gone under as a direct result of your mandates. Children have lost valuable learning time in school as a direct result of your mandates. Suicides, depression, and substance abuse have increased as a direct result of your mandates. We say no more. The pandemic has run its course and it is now endemic. We must learn to live with it like we do a common cold or flu. We demand that all mandates be removed immediately and all county employees that were fired over mandates be reinstated. We say no more mandates. Stop the insanity now. Thank you. David, before you move on to the next one, yes. I'm gonna make I'm gonna ask that you make a list of whatever individuals choose to speak on a COVID public health item because that's an item that is on the agenda today at one o'clock and we don't, it's not appropriate that people speak twice. We wanna make it fair for everyone. So the last couple of speakers and any going forward that choose to speak about the COVID and the public health and the mandates uh, will not be able to speak when that item comes up at one o'clock. Understood, we'll, we'll make a note of that, thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Rita Ursua. You have one minute, please go ahead. Rita, are you there? Rita is not responding. We will move on to the next speaker. The next speaker is Lan. You have one minute. Please go ahead. My name is Lan Nguyen, and I'm with the Common Sense to Save Our County Coalition. I live in vote in District 3. For two years, we've been subjected to your lockdowns and mandates, which have negatively impacted our daily lives in numerous ways. Countless people in our county have lost their jobs as a direct result of your mandates. Businesses have gone under and children have lost valuable learning time in school as a direct result of your mandates. Suicides, depression, and substance abuse have increased as a direct result of your mandates. 
The pandemic has run its course and it is now an endemic. We must learn to live with it like a common cold. We demand that all mandates be removed immediately and that all employees who in, the, in the county who were fired over the mandates be reinstated. No more mandates. There's a mass mandate protest today at noon at the Santa Clara County Public Health Department. It would be really nice if Dr. Cody would attend 976 Lenzen Avenue in San Jose. David, I need to apologize to the speakers. We had the COVID presentation last meeting. It is not on this meeting's agenda. So what they are doing is appropriate. Understood, thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Irvish. I'm unmuting you. You have one minute. Please go ahead. Thank you very much to uh, Board of Supervisor. I wanted to emphasize on being on this, being in a Silicon Valley, what becomes more important is the awareness about the international humanitarian law and as well as the technology advancement and the cyber warfare. It is important that that the civilian must understand that the how the humanitarian law works and as well as celebrating any heritage festival as well as any culture or festivity, how that relates to achieving the proclamation as well as uh, celebrating the anniversary in lieu of the uh, the establishing the foundation for the culture with the another country as well as establishing sister communities and to understand that you know how humanitarian law helps enhancing the community to community relationship as well i request board of supervisor to include the agenda with the uh, with the with the awareness you know within the next speaker is richard ruiz you have one minute please go ahead So Richard Branson said, train people well enough so they can leave, treat them well enough so they don't want to. Losing 25% of the workforce in four years due to unharmonious conditions is not what he meant. A dispatcher's quality of life, including physical and mental health, should be at the forefront of every decision and policy made by management. The key factors being unconditional support by management, shift stability, and time away from work with our families. The Space Shuttle Challenger tragedy was an accident that could have been avoided. Equipment issues documented by the engineers were brought forth to both contractor and NASA management advising against a launch that in doing so could result in a catastrophe of the highest order, loss of human life. Management ignored the warnings and proceeded with the launch. In comparison to Challenger, dispatchers have pointed out to management time and again numerous issues with shifts, staffing, vacations, and overtime, saying it will get harder to keep people here. P please come talk to the dispatchers because the quality of life is bad now and things keep going the way they're going. It'll only get worse. Thank you. Next speaker is Kimberly Went. You have one minute. Please go ahead. Hi, good morning, and thank you very much. I am also a dispatcher with the County of Santa Clara and wanted to bring attention to the issues that we're having. We are down to 56 signed off dispatchers with a quota of 78 total. The 56 that are signed off, we are mandatorily working 10 to 12 extra shifts every month. That equates to 40 to 48 hours in addition to our 160 normal hours. Majority of us are working 10 to 14 hours on regular days, regular weeks, just to get in the overtime because we cannot keep people at this department for numerous reasons. People don't realize what we do, the hours, the stress of the job in general. We cannot keep going at the amount of overtime that we are going and our management's concerned about nothing but dress code. Next speaker is Karen. You have one minute, please go ahead. Good morning, everyone. My name is Karen Del Compara. I'm with the Common Sense to Save Our County Coalition. I live in Vote and Smithians District. For two years, We've been subjected to your lockdowns and mandates, which have negatively impacted our day-to-day -day lives in numerous ways. Countless people in our county have lost their jobs as a direct result of your mandates. Businesses have gone under as a direct result of your mandates. Children have lost valuable learning time in school as a direct result of your mandates. Suicides, depression, substance abuse have increased as a direct result of your mandates. We say no more. The pandemic has run its course and it is now endemic. We must learn to live with it like we do a common cold or flu. 
We demand that all mandates be removed immediately and that all county employees that were fired over mandates be reinstated. We say no more mandates. The next speaker is Barry Arata. You have one minute. Please go ahead. Good morning. Thank you for taking me. Um, I have a minute, so I just want to address a few things. Um, morning raised again for anybody that hasn't heard this in Santa Clara County. I live. Thank you. You need to speak a little louder. Can you hear me better now? Yes, I can. Thank you. Thank you for pointing that out. Just want to let everybody know I'm a resident, of Santa Clara County, born and raised here. I still live here. Um, again, I work for the San Jose Fire Department and I'm on unpaid leave because of the vaccine mandate put forth by Dr. Sarah Cody and our public health. It's one of the most extreme in the state of California. Unfortunately, tomorrow will mark two weeks with about 88 firefighters in San Jose that are on unpaid leave because they either don't want to get vaccinated or they don't want to get boosted and the religious and medical exemptions have been removed. I've reached out to all supervisors and thank you to Supervisor Simidian's office for having a meeting with me. And I requested an emergency meeting so we can discuss this. Our unions have discussed it with you. They've told us to work with the Florida Supervisor directly. Please respond to my email. Next speaker is Rosalinda Nunez. You have one minute. Please go ahead. Good morning. My name is Rosalinda Nunez. I'm a disability worker. I'm speaking this, this, this morning about the issue of church passing and I'm sorry, we're having a hard time understanding you. Could you get a little closer to the mic, perhaps? Okay. My name is Katie now. Yes. Okay. My name is Rosalinda Nunez, and I'm here to speak about the church and uh, safety in the department. Over the last two years, during this pandemic, we, we have seen applications for much needed benefits and service. We want to be able to provide these services in a timely manner. Unfortunately, we are backlog from various services of the program and even the remote work and cut outbreaks, leading to further short staffing and less services more provided. The county wants to bring in um, in classroom training for new or present classroom training for new eligibility workers from 50 to 80. If there is an outbreak, this will lead to uh, even further shortage. The labor relations have stated that if we cannot pick up more work, Next speaker is Isabel Price. You have one minute. Please go ahead. Good morning. My name is Isabel Price and I'm an appeals officer. Appeals officer, officers are charged with ensuring due process for welfare clients who believe that mistakes have been made in their cases and who wish to challenge those decisions. Appeals officers are one of the few vehicles that afford clients the opportunity to contest welfare policies and procedures. We manage over 15 programs. We must have the expertise of all programs to be able to litigate our findings in a fair hearing before administrative law judge. Since 2018, our salaries have not been aligned to eligibility work supervisors. However, there is precedent from 2014. We ask that president be observed for equitably aligned salary for el with eligibility work supervisors, just as in 2014. Thank you for your time and for your support. Next speaker is Jason McInerney. You have one minute. Please go ahead. Yes, thank you for your time. Um, we need to end these mask mandates and vaccine mandates for everybody. This, it's unconstitutional. People have the right to choose for themselves what they want to do for themselves. If you want to wear a mask, wear a mask. If you want to, if you don't, don't. If you want a vaccine, go get one. If you want to get boosted 10, 15 times, go ahead and do it. But if you don't, then don't. You don't have the right to dictate to people what they do with their own body. It's unconstitutional. It's impacting our kids. My kids are out of school more than they're in school. They've wasted two years of school on this. It's absolutely ridiculous and it should be lifted immediately. Thank you. Next speaker is a phone caller ending in 150. You have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Phone caller ending in 150. Hi, can you hear me? Go ahead. This is emergency nurse Bobby here, and I've been fortunate enough to find work in another state after spending my last four years working as an ER nurse here. It's very different working in a place that doesn't have any mask mandates, 
and I'm not harassed for my vaccination status. And our ER even has low census. Like at nighttime, we're lucky to even have three patients. Unable to work in Santa Clara County since November 1st, I just want the Board of Supervisors to know that the flu virus doesn't disappear and neither will the coronavirus. It continues to mutate. We need to move forward. Nurses from out of state do not want to come here because it's too expensive. So I'm asking you to think about employing your experienced staff who remains in the county before they leave. If we go to war with Russia, you're going to want your paramedics and healthcare staff employed. Do not go against the Constitution and nursing rights. We have the right to refuse. I am anti-mandate. I want to thank you all for listening, but I need you to hear me. You don't meet your goals without the health service community backing you. I hold public health and lack of nursing thank information. You. Next speaker is Mary Gloner. You have one minute. Please go ahead. Thank you. I live in Vice President Ellenberg's district and work in Supervisor Submitians. I want to thank the Board of Supervisors and Dr. Cody for your continued leadership combating the COVID-19, keeping science and our county's public health values front and center. As a community mental and public health professional and a Filipino American, I value that wearing a mask coupled with vaccination is a simple, accessible, and affordable, if not free, mechanism that reduces our risk for this disease. It's a fortunate privilege that we easily take for granted living in the United States, where my family's provincial hometown, the Philippines, have been decimated by COVID-19 because they don't have access or these um, supportive, valuable policies that keep human lives front and center. Thank you. Next speaker is a phone caller ending in 052. You have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Hello, oh, my no. name is Maylene. I have been with the County of Santa Clara for 20 years serving our community. I am currently working as a social services appeals officer. We resolve most complex issues, complaints, and ensure that our clients are fully informed of all the state and federal regulations and policies. We re represent the County of Santa Clara and prepare all the extensive appeal cases to hearings. In the past, the appeals unit experienced tremendous employee retention because of caseload and used the position as a stepping stone to promote to an eligibility work supervisor position. Hence, the Board of Supervisors approved the appeals officer reclassification on August 26, 2014 and granted a wage level comparable to eligibility work supervisors. We are seeking for your assistance to be aligned again with the eligibility work supervisors pay as they received 10% increase in July 2018. While the appeals officer only received 1% increase during the 2018 contract negotiation, we are not requesting for retro but just to have an equitable pay as eligibility. Next speaker is Dolores Alvarado. You have one minute. Please go ahead. Good morning, Board of Supervisors. My name is Dolores. I am a resident of District 1 and the CEO of Community Health Partnership, representing over 250,000 patients and 10 community health center organizations with 40 sites. Um, I'm calling in support and gratitude to the County of Santa Clara's Public Health Department and to you, Board, for um, allowing the department to respond to COVID-19 and, and to the variants in a way that they have. This includes protection via the masks, vaccinations, testing, et cetera. So oh, thank, thank, you for doing, thank, you. thank you for doing your job. Um, super, thank super. you. I don't know what's going on there, but there's other voices coming in, but I want to thank the county and the public health department for doing their job. You know, if they weren't doing their job, uh, yeah, children may be home, but they would end up dead as opposed to, you know, missing uh, classes, which in fact is very sad, but dead. Next speaker is Holly Slack. You have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Holly Slack, are you there? Okay, Holly is not responding. Oh, go ahead. My name is Holly Slack and I've been a dispatcher for 21 years. County Comm Management has opened our departmental agreement so that they can take away a dispatcher's shift protections. Management wants the ability to take away a dispatcher's shift and change them to what they want, when they want, for whatever reason they want. This will cause more chaos in the control room. The nine year staffing crisis will continue. In the past four years, County Communications has lost approximately 25% of its workforce and another 10% are planning on early retirement in the next couple of years. 
Dispatchers have had their available vacation hours reduced by 50%, yet dispatchers routinely work over 40 hours of mandatory overtime per month. The advantages of working for County Com versus other agencies have disappeared, leaving a fractured department and an anxiety-filled, unhappy, and hostile environment. Please reach out to county dispatchers so they can provide personal accounts of these conditions. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Next speaker is Sparky Harlan. You have one minute. Please go ahead. Hi, Sparky Harlan, CEO of Bill Wilson Center. And I felt like last week I should have spoken up when uh, Jeff Smith was being attacked relentlessly by um, the employees who said they could no longer work because they weren't being vaccinated. I support his strong mandate. It has helped Bill Wilson Center's 250 employees that I always say they need to be wearing masks and also vaccinated. Last May, we changed our policy so all new hires had to be fully vaccinated. It's because of the action by you and the county that I could do that. With your mandate, it allows me to have the same mandate and protect our kids who are vulnerable from COVID and our families and our employees. So thank you, Dr. Smith and Dr. Cody for your strong measures against COVID. Next speaker is Darlene Falcon. You have one minute, please go ahead. Darlene, are you there? Darlene. Good morning, my name is Darlene Falcon. Um, I have been a county employee for nine years. I've been a social services appeals officer for almost four years. In the past, when appeals officers earn less than eligibility worker supervisors, we had a high turnover rate. Eligibility workers would promote to appeals officers to put their salaries within reach of promoting to a supervisor. This created a hiring and training burden on the appeals unit, and at one point reduced our staff of 14 by half making it nearly impossible to serve our claimants and address their hearing issues. I too ask this board to prevent this situation from arising again by observing the precedent and, equi and equitably align the appeals officer's salaries with the eligibility worker supervisor salaries, as was done in 2014. By aligning our salaries with those of the supervisor's merit-based promotions will prevail and stability within our unit personnel maintained. Thank you. Next speaker is Candace Vangolino. You have one minute. Please go ahead. Candace, are you there? Candace is not I'm responding. Here. I'm no. here. Can you hear me? Go ahead. Okay. Um, I have been a dispatcher for nine years and mandatory overtime is all I have ever known. We are required to work anywhere from 40 to 50 extra hours a month, about 500 to 600 hours a year, while our time off has been cut dramatically to an improved maximum of 240 uh, 40 hours a year if you're able to get random days off, almost diminishing our mental health and personal wellness days. Disp dispatchers are experiencing burnout. It is not uncommon for us to be carrying out the job functions of multiple positions because of short staffing, sometimes leaving calls in the queue because we simply don't have anyone to answer them or the inability of management, being proactive and cross-training dispatchers in different communities, a request we have also brought to light. Instead, what seems to be on the forefront of getting accomplished is implementing a dress code. It's concerning that our focus is not how to keep the small amount of staff we have been able to hire or provide proper training to ensure we are given all the tools to better help our community, but instead our focus is on what we are wearing while answering calls and providing emergency services. We're left with very little perks that make working for our department more. Next speaker is Delilah Pulido. You have one minute, please go ahead. Hi, um, please stop virtue, virtue signaling. You've praised the vaccinated as if higher than thou. You talk about thanking them for their work during the pandemic, but do you forget that all the workers that were placed on unpaid leave worked the entire time? Stop spreading propaganda that divides the vaccinated against the unvaccinated. Dictators throughout history use propaganda to, to divide the people to commit atrocious acts. You are doing the same. I've come across so many people that repeat the same thing you have to do that. You have to do it for the greater good, just like a cult repeating the same thing that is being spread by you, the news, etc. You pick and choose where you feel safe taking off your mask or being exposed to unvaccinated workers. If you or a loved one was in a life or death situation and the only person around to offer life saving help was unvaccinated, I'm certain you wouldn't refuse their help. I'm certain you wouldn't stop to ask if they are if they are vaccinated or not. So stop with the hypocrisy. 
To the Board of Supervisors, it's time for you to read the Constitution you were meant to protect. Leadership is not controlling. Next speaker is Lydia. You have one minute. Please go ahead. Yes, hi. Um, I'm placed on unpaid leave after 20 years serving Santa Clara County as a nurse and doing front. I came up with a medical leave to go to the front line at the Moore Park Urgent Care because of a desperate call. And I'm, uh, I'm concerned. I'm concerned about your morality because I'm hearing a lot of calls coming in from dispatchers clearly telling you that they're short staffed and I'm, I'm concerned you guys are not hearing them. You don't care. You are on a path of destruction for the citizens that you were supposed to serve. We, the people demand that you do the will of the people and stop this illegal and overwhelmingly unconstitutional mandate requiring all high risk employees to be vaxxed. This is extortion and coercion at its core. At its core. Take the shout shot or lose your job, we pay your salary, you work for us. We have educated ourselves, we are watching you, we are organizing. Next speaker is Dan Kiernan. You have one minute, please go ahead. Thanks for giving me the chance to speak. Um, I'm here to talk about the continuation of the mask mandates. I think Sarah and team has done an amazing job in getting to the point where we have some of the best vaccination rates in the country. But in light of Governor Newsom's um, removal of mask mandates across the state, it makes no sense that we continue to wear masks in the Bay Area when all other counties have removed them. You know that we travel back and forth up and down the Bay. So having pretending that we have a porous or a non-porous border between these counties, it logically makes no sense to continue masks. We have to align with the state in order to make this work or not work. So right now, it makes no sense to continue to have masks uh, and continue to wear masks in this county when all other counties around us um, uh, are, are removing them. So please, I wish you to um, pressure Sarah to rescind her order. Thank you. The next speaker is Willis. You have one minute. Please go ahead. Oh, one moment, please. It uh, looks like Willis is using an older version of Zoom. We will not be able to take his comments at this time. Thank you, Dave. Next speaker is Aaron Noriega. You have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Hello. Uh, I've worked for the County of Santa Clara for 23 years. Uh, when is this clown show of a, a pandemic going to end? Um, if nothing's more evident than this is a clown show, is uh, the NFC playoff game and the Super Bowl where all the elites, celebrities, professional athletes, we're, we're going around maskless. Give me a break, guys. Who's paying your salary, okay? This is ridiculous. You guys are taking away people's livelihoods. You need to end all of this crap. This is just nothing more than a sideshow. All those people that feel that they're protected, great. Keep masking up, do what you want. It's time to let people live, because if not, you guys are gonna continue to lose people. Uh, this state is gonna lose all the good people that actually wanna work. You guys need to stop this stuff. You guys don't even deserve to have the positions you're in. All these public health officials saying that they're, they're, they're following the science. What science? The science that you guys want to pick? That's crap. You guys aren't following the science. Next speaker is Darcy Green. You have one minute. Please go ahead. Darcy, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Hi, this is Darcy Green, Executive Director of Latinas Contra Cancer. I'm also a parent to a kindergartner here in the county and a caregiver for an immunocompromised loved one, a parent actually. Um, I'd like to just thank the county, um, Dr. Cody and the administration for swift action and leadership during this pandemic. We see clients every day who are severely immunocompromised and are panicked, um, are afraid for their health and continue to be facing these same concerns. Uh, we know that this mandate is very important to saving lives and we just really appreciate and support the continued, um, the extension of it. And just as one resident of the county, thank you so much for what you've done to keep our clients alive, to help me keep my father alive and to take care of my son. Thank you. Next speaker is Paula Maddox. You have one minute, please go ahead. Hi, my name is Paula Maddox. 
Um, I am with uh, District 5. Um, for the last two years, we have been subjected to all the lockdowns and mandates, which we have been negatively impacted. I'm not opposed to the vaccines, but I am opposed to the vaccine mandates. Um, if these vaccines did in fact work, we would not have everybody calling in and supporting these mandates because they would not be scared um, because the vaccines would be doing their jobs, but they are not doing their jobs, which is why there's so much confrontation back and forth on what should be done. I don't agree with the mask mandates because other counties are doing less restrictions. And like the other caller had said, we're driving in and out of different counties I do agree with protecting the elderly and protecting those that have some immune compromised um, deficiencies. However, we need to move forward and live our lives. Thank you. Next speaker is Joe. You have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Good morning, Board of Supervisors. I'd like to speak about the mandate as well. Uh, I appreciate the interest made by Supervisor Chavez and Wasserman last uh, meeting to inquire about aligning our county health order with that of the state. By doing so, this would save jobs and allow for firefighters, EMS, and hospital employees with approved medical exemptions to keep serving those in need and keep their jobs. Uh, during this election year, please show us the public that you are listening to what we are asking and listening to our concerns. There is a common solution that provides for serving the public safely and also honoring uh, frontline essential disaster workers. Um, Supervisor Wasserman, while you reflect on your service as Board of Supervisor coming to an end, please consider adding to your legacy by collabor collaborating with fellow supervisors in county health to save our jobs by aligning with the state um, health orders. Thank you very much for your time. Next speaker is a phone caller ending in 610. You have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Good morning. I'm Rita. I'm Rita, currently working as an appeals officer. In appeals, we conduct extensive research of applicable federal, state, and county eligibility regulations and determine whether county action under appeal is correct. We manage all state and county programs. We make certain that appropriate support and quality services provided to our low-income families, working community, disabled or elderly clients. In 2014, ESA recommended to compensate the appeals officers equivalent to eligibility work supervisors because our position requires in-depth knowledge of all programs as we represent the county and respond to administrative law dodges to prove that our county follows the program regulations. The board approved a reclassification, which was adapted on August 26, 2014, under I-1551 to 52. We're grateful then to the board for approving to transform our position from eligibility examin examiner to social services appeals. Next speaker is Jason Went. You have one minute. Please go ahead. Jason, are you there? Oh, there we go. Okay, let's make this work. Can you hear me now? Go ahead. Okay. Um, I thank you for your time this morning. And uh, I just want to say I'm a husband of one of your 911 dispatchers. Uh, these are your employees that daily absorb three times the stress of your other public safety members, such as paramedics, firefighters, and your deputies. Uh, your public safety communications dispatchers need your care and attention now. Uh, the communication center needs management attention, the pandemic aside. Uh, your dispatchers have been required to work in excess of 25% of their regular expected hours. This can be expected during the pandemic, but this has been going on for nine years. Uh, this is an additional two years of work service that's taken them away from their families. You took, in, took this issue up some years ago, and I request that you revisit this issue again so that these uh, uh, situations can be handled and we can bring some of these people back and Next speaker is Joni Murphy. You have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Hi. I wanted to comment on these mandates, these must end. The pandemic has been going on for over two years now. And Santa Clara County needs to not only align 
with the rest of California and other counties, but we need to stop having our freedoms taken away. There has been valuable learning time in the schools that have been lost, suicides, depression, substance abuse. And I just say, please, no more. Thank you. The next speaker is a phone caller ending in 587. You have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Phone caller ending in 587. I've asked you to unmute. Are you there? Good morning, supervisors. This is Tyler Haskell from on behalf of Santa Clara Family Health Plan, which covers nearly 300,000 Medi-Cal enrollees in the county. And I'm just here to say that we support the judgment of the medical community and the health officers' continued efforts to keep our community safe through common sense, science-based approaches to COVID. And we thank them for doing so. Next speaker is Gary Montresa. You have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Good morning. I'm Gary Montreza, CEO for Pathway Society. We provide quite a bit of inpatient residential substance use treatment services for the county. I want to commend Dr. Cody for her leadership, judgment, discernment. We understand vaccines work quite well because all of us are vaccinated. We work with folks that are quite vulnerable. Masks work. We're following the data when the vaccinated, when, when the vaccination rate um, infection rate for vaccinated folks goes down, we'll loosen some of our guidelines. It was her data and her team's data that have helped inform that our population and our um, staff remain safe and active and, and being able to provide services to the community that are much needed. Thank you. Next speaker is Kevin. You have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? I'm actually driving in the car. Yes, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I'm a firefighter for Santa Clara County Fire Department. Uh, I'm not allowed to work. I should have worked two days ago on my shift, but instead they had an open seat on a fire engine. We had less firefighters than, than we should have because um, I'm medically unable to get the booster shot. I just, I hope the Board of Supervisors are hearing all the, the stress and the people's voices calling in, um, the livelihoods that have been lost for first responders uh, that were essential workers and now they're uh, they're expendable workers, unfortunately. Um, I've asked Dr. Sarah Cody and Dr. Smith to take a meeting with first responders in the county, 100 plus first responders, want to meet with them, talk with them, come up with a solution uh, where people aren't stressed, aren't losing their jobs, the public is still safe. Unfortunately, um, neither will, will take a meeting. I haven't had any response back. It's disappointing, um, discerning that that the executive and the health director will come out with mandates and not take these meetings. Next speaker is Lisa. You have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Lisa, are you there? Hi, I was really upset um, last week when I called in because it's really, um, it's really hard to listen to all these people who keep explaining to you guys the situation that's going on and nobody wants to listen, nobody wants to talk. All the first responders, especially my son who is a first responder, has to deal with all this, I don't know, I wanna say bull crap. But again, I just want to thank all the people that who continue to call in. I hope you continue to keep calling because I was just not even gonna bother because it seems like you guys really don't care. If you really did care, like the fireman said before, you guys would take meetings. You guys would respond to us. All you do is just let us talk for one minute. But if, again, you look at all the crowds, everybody who's less than six feet apart, everybody who's not wearing masks, why aren't they all gone? Why isn't things happening to them? I think this is all crazy, but God bless you all. And you will, you will feel his wrath. Next speaker is Deanna Merzadegan. You have one minute, please go ahead. Hi, I want to thank uh, Supervisor Chavez for introducing uh, the referral to uh, regulate the uh, recreational use of nitrous oxide. Most people are not aware that young kids and young adults are using and abusing the substance and it is um, being bought in vape shops, smoke shops and dispensaries. 
it's illegal to sell it for inhalation, but yet it's being sold in stores that um, specialize in inhalation. And um, we're long past due in regulating this dangerous substance, which is leading to addiction, homelessness, mental health issues. Uh, kids start doing it because they think it's safe and it is not. So thank you. Please vote for the referral. Thank you. Next speaker is Walter Wilson. You have one minute. Please go ahead. Uh, good morning, President Wasserman, um, Board of Supervisors and staff. Um, I want to take this opportunity to join with um, Sister Alma Burrell from the Roots Clinic and uh, co-chair for the BLKC and thanking you for the commendation for the African African Ancestry Health and Heritage Month. But I think one important aspect that, that we haven't talked about is the thing that's made this um, program so successful over the last four or five years is the work that's being done by Santa Clara County Public Health Department, our very important partners in making this happen because it is about health and the, the people that we have working with us are bringing so many resources to our community um, each year when we do this and throughout the year, of course, but but particularly during this month that um, I think they deserve a word of commendation for the work that they're doing. Thank you so much. Thank you, Walter. Next speaker is Colin Connors. You have one minute. Please go ahead. Good morning, Santa Clara Board of Supervisors. Last Sunday there, there was a giant protest in Southern California. 80,000 plus people converged on SoFi Stadium in Los Angeles for an anti-mask protest. It was amazing. Celebrities and common folk alike packed in shoulder to shoulder and none of them, not one was wearing a mask. It was such a, sex, a successful event that even the mayor of Los Angeles, Idiot Garcetti was there in support. Today, our governor, the honorable Newsom will lift the indoor mass state mass mandate for the great state of California. But unfortunately, tomorrow, the citizens of Santa Clara will still be wearing a mask indoors and their children will still be muzzled while attending school. We will be the only county in California that will still have a man. Next speaker is Cody Griggs. You have one minute. Please go ahead. Yeah, good morning. Thanks, Board of Supervisors, for taking my call. Um, I've called a few times in the last couple of meetings. Um, I'm a firefighter in the county. I work for Santa Clara County. I'm on leave without pay because of Sarah Cody's health mandate. Um, I have a medical exemption. I cannot get vaccinated. Uh, I've been responding to COVID calls for the last two years. I went from frontline hero to now I'm someone who's getting fired. So uh, no one in my department's ever spread COVID to the public or got it from the public on calls. So we need to work to figure out how to keep us uh, at our jobs here. This isn't working. I'm the sole provider for my family. Uh, I have a baby coming and I'm out of work. So please let me keep working with the mask as I've been doing this whole time and testing. And that's been working great for us. So I ask that you guys work with Sarah Cody to do something about this health order. Thank you. That concludes our request to speak. Thank you, David. I appreciate that. That concludes item seven, public comment. We now move on to item eight, which is approval of the consent calendar and any changes. And David, need you to read through this. We have a request from Vice President Ellenberg to add item number 14 to the consent calendar. Item number 14 is to approve county sponsorship of Elevate Community Center in the amount of $2,500 from the Supervisorial District 3 allocation in the Office of the Clerk of the Board fiscal year 2021-2022 budget to support community criminal record clearance project. We have a request from the district attorney to hold item number 25 to March 8, 2022. Item 25 is to receive a report relating to the intimate partner violence strangulation response program. We have a request from administration to hold item number 26 to March 8, 2022. Item number 26 is to receive a report relating to neighborhood impacts and benefits of short term rental and accessory dwelling unit usage, fees and revenue and history within unincorporated Santa Clara County. We have a request from administration to hold item number 27 to April 19th, 2022. Item number 27 is to receive response from the Custody Health Services Department relating to the report from the Office of Correction and Law Enforcement Monitoring regarding the review of certain custody health functions. 
We have a request from Vice President Ellenberg to remove, remove item numbers 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, and 40 from the consent calendar to be considered concurrently with item numbers 18 and 19. Item number 33 is to approve a request for appropriation modification number 148, $1,731,850, increasing revenue and expenditures in the Santa Clara Valley Medical Center budget relating to expansion of cancer care services for the enterprise. Item number 34 is adoption of salary ordinance number NS-5.22.87 relating to compensation of employees, adding various positions in Santa Clara Valley Medical Center. Item number 35 is approve request for appropriation modification number 150, $571,767, increasing revenue and expenditures in the Santa Clara Valley Medical Center Hospitals and Clinics budget relating to staffing for CalAIM implementation. Item number 36 is adoption of salary ordinance number NS-5.22.85 relating to compensation of employees, adding eight clinical nurse three or clinical nurse two or clinical nurse one positions, two community worker positions, and one management analyst or associate management analyst position in Santa Clara Valley Medical Center relating to CalAIM implementation. Item number 37 is to approve request for appropriation modification number 147, $209,684, transferring funds from the general fund reserve for federal and state impacts to the Santa Clara Valley Medical Center budget relating to expansion of renal care services. Item number 38 is adoption of salary ordinance number NS-5.22.91 relating to compensation of employees, adding various positions in Santa Clara Valley Medical Center relating to the expansion of renal care services. Item number 39, Approve request for appropriation modification number 117, $1,365,051, increasing revenue and expenditures in the Santa Clara Valley Medical Center budget relating to adding positions for expansion of dental services. Item number 40, adoption of salary ordinance number NS-5.22.86, relating to compensation of employees, adding various positions in Santa Clara Valley Medical Center relating to expanding dental services. Item number 18, approve request for mo appropriation modification number 124, $997,557, transferring funds from the general fund reserve for federal and state impacts to the Santa Clara Valley Medical Center budget relating to adding positions to augment inpatient and outpatient services at VMC at Bascom. Item number 19 is adoption of salary ordinance number NS-5.22.79 relating to compensation of employees, adding various positions in Santa Clara Valley Medical Center. And that concludes my list. David, you're a superstar. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. All right, board members, before we turn to the public, any additions or deletions? I'm looking for a hand raised. Vice President Ellenberg. Thank you so much, uh, Supervisor Wasserman, and my uh, apologies to, to my colleagues and the staff and public for being a few moments late today. I just want to make a comment on item 54. I don't need to remove it from consent. Uh, given our discussion last week on COVID expenditures and revenues, I, the report itself is fine. But I would just like to reiterate my comments from last week uh, that, that I think we need to continue to carefully monitor both our ongoing response expenditures and the distribution of those costs among the four buckets of resources available to the county as were presented last week. Uh, restricted grants or revenues, FEMA, inverse, uh, FEMA reimbursement, ARPA, and county discretionary funds. And as we move into the second half of this fiscal year, I would really like to strongly encourage administration to carefully weigh financial decisions related to the direct COVID response versus the broader social, economic, and mental health recovery effort. Wherever possible, we should be encouraging our local health system partners to continue to step up their testing and vaccination services to reduce the financial burden on the county system and to be able to also support investments in the long-term community recovery. Uh, we heard from finance an estimate of between 300 million and 600 million for expected COVID response costs for the second half of our fiscal year after realizing a billion dollars in expenses during the first half. And while the costs have been and, and certainly will continue to be dependent on a number of factors outside our control, I want to um, emphasize that we need to be very intentional and thoughtful 
about this spending stream as we look at funding ability for mental health initiatives and the children's agenda for recovery. Thanks. Thank you. Vice President Ellenberg, that was on what item? 54? Oh, item 54. That was your, okay. And the other items that you pulled to be heard with 18 and 19 remain. Correct. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Supervisor Smidian. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to indicate that I will be a no vote. Again, a no vote on item 66. These are the redistricting maps. Uh, that's consistent with my prior vote uh, or votes on this item. And uh, just again, uh, uh, an exhortation to staff to move as quickly as they possibly can on making uh, usable maps, both hard copy and digital, uh, readily available for board members, but also for the public. Again, a no vote on item 66 for the clerk who is reporting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. On item 54, um, I wanted to um, weigh in and I will also leave it on consent, but um, I'm really concerned about the, the scaling back of the door-to-door -door and community efforts, particularly the uh, Chibet program and our door-to-door -door program. And I'm concerned about it because I think we're going to need continued outreach in particular as I imagine that we're going to have um, at some point, a, um, you know, a removal of mandates. And as those mandates get removed, we're going to continue to need to do um, community engagement. Um, the other thing I wanted to just alert my colleagues to is that we've had a significant increase in our CalFresh applications based on our door to door work. And I, I think that what we're trying to do is right size where people are getting resources long term. And I think from a strategic perspective, making sure that we're continuing that effort to get people appropriately signed up for that service is very important. So what I want to recommend is that as part of the um, report out for our next board meeting where we have a COVID report that the staff um, detail how the Office of Supportive Housing and the Public Health Department will be responding to these functions or whatever um, department, Dr. Smith, you think this is most appropriate to respond to. Um, the other thing I'd like to just say is I appreciate Supervisor Ellenberg's direction that the report includes information about how we're addressing the needs of the disabled community and would like to ask that staff include information relating to the meaningful and ongoing inclusion of the disability community in the county's emergency response and disaster planning efforts as it relates to um, both the item 54 and when COVID comes back to us in March, but also as it relates to the, the um, body of work that, uh, I'm sorry, the positions that were added last week that will be coming through FGOC so that when that report comes to FGOC about the utilization of those positions that we're also having a discussion about the, um, the uh, outreach being done for the disability affairs uh, community or the disabled uh, community. Um, and then finally, on 58 through 64, I'm going to ask staff that as these reports come forward, especially as it relates to housing, that we're clearly denoting uh, the main maintenance of um, property ownership in these projects and where we're not going to be um, maintaining ownership of the projects, I'm sorry, of the land in particular, that that be pulled out and highlighted for the board. And as part of those items, I just wanted to acknowledge the how exciting I think it is to see us continuing to invest in item 64, which will um, is really focused on expanding prevention to homelessness. And I think Supervisor Wasserman was right that the solution to housing, I mean, I'm to, sorry, to the homeless is housing and also making sure people don't become homeless in the first place. So um, thank you for that good work. Thank you very much. Supervisor Lee, your hand is not raised, so I'll make my comments. Um, my comment is for the public record on item number 66, which was the new redistricting maps. Uh, um, I am a no vote, similar to when we originally did it. I am a no vote on 66. And with that, we'll turn to public speakers. David, we're going to go one minute each for the remainder of this agenda. Um, we spent a lot of time getting to this point where we are now and I wanna to try to, to uh, expedite things as much as possible, especially with referrals that have a 99.9% .9 success rate.
So if we could please hear from the speakers. Understood. We'll keep the timer set at one minute for the rest of the meeting. Thank you for the notification. Thank you. Next speaker is Paul Soto. You have one minute. Please go ahead. Uh, yes, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Well, that's very kind of you, uh, President Wasserman, to uh, circumvent and uh, minimize democracy. See, because you guys could just have these meetings then. You, you guys could just have these meetings on your own, not involve the public. Why do you involve the public? Because we are the most important people at this meeting, not you. We are. And I think sometimes, like, you know, the, like the ego gets, like, gets a hold of you and you think that you're the most important person. And you're not. You're really not. Because your decisions impact our lives. And you need to hear exactly, expeditiously uh, going through your calendar. That's not a priority. It's really not. What is a priority is that you listen to the people and you understand how your decisions impact our lives. And to say that we can do that in one minute and to arrogate that privilege to yourself is the height of arrogance. Next speaker is Tessa Woodmancy. You have one minute, please go ahead. Thank you, Paul Soto of the Horseshoe for reminding the community of the importance of the people. And it is the people because the people do not have a vested interest in, um, they don't have, they're not making any money. On, on doing this. And so where you guys are, and like I say with my son's campaign, Marshall Woodman C for um, mayor, it's not what we say, it's what we do. And that that's in terms of our climate crisis. It's not what we say, it's what we do. And we need to lead by example. And I call Marshall, Marshall a fossil fuel free man, and we need to follow him. But getting back to the dental issue, so staying on track, is that we do need to, um, have a better dental program in the city. Um, the way, you know, for medical um, people, that it needs to be where you go and you get your, your, your COVID test and you wear masks, and that makes it safe for us to go into dental services. So we need to have that in all our dental services. So we appreciate improving dental. Next speaker is Irvish. You have one minute. Please go ahead. Thank you very much to uh, Board of Supervisors as well as, as, well as the county staff. I again, I wanted to emphasize on on uh, on the topic of a climate change and as well as keeping the environment clean, as it is important to to address uh, the challenges for that how the nitrogen uh, oxide nitro, nitrous oxide causing the injury and death, as well as uh, with the health issues within the county of Santa Clara. It is important that within the open preserve space and as well as the recreational activities wherever. The utilization of the nitrous, the nitrous oxide equipments are there. It is important to measure the the 410 as as well as the C32, uh, C32 appearance within those uh, those equipments as they omit the nitrous oxide. And it is well known that you know how it is you know causing the health issues. Certainly a topic to consider for the climate change and environment cleanliness. Thank you very much. That concludes our request to speak. Thank you, David. I appreciate that. Board members, do we have a motion to approve the consent calendar with the changes noted? So moved. moved. Chavez, oh. Thank you. I've got a motion by Vice President Ellenberg and a second by Chavez. Any further discussion? Seeing none, roll call vote, please. David? Supervisor Lee. Supervisor Lee? Supervisor Lee, you're muted. Let's come back to. We'll come back. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Samidian? Samidian, I, with a no vote on item 66, please. Thank you. Vice President Ellenberg? Yes. President Wasserman? I, with a no vote on 66. And we have Thank Supervisor you. Lee back. And one more time for Supervisor Lee. Your vote, sir? Thank you. Uh, sorry about the technical problem. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. With that, we move on to item number two, which is an approval of a referral. Supervisor Chavez? Thank you. This is item number nine. Did I say, I'm sorry, did I say six? That's okay. You said two, but I, I get it when you're chairing. There's a lot of paper in front of nine. you. So Thank just you. catching everybody up. Um, I want to see, we have no members of the public. So let me just introduce this, um, colleagues. Uh, I was approached by Deanna, who spoke earlier today, who was very concerned about the sale and use of this um, 
gas by youth and others in our community, then the danger of its use is clear. Its recreational use is a misdemeanor that has the potential to result in as much as six months in jail. The referral will result in staff and council coming back to the board with measures that the board and the county may be able to take to address nitrous oxide that being so readily available in vape shops, smoke shops, and possibly in other types of dispensaries. I understand that because of the existing state law, there may be issues of preemption. I want to assure my colleagues that this referral was done in collaboration with um, county council's office. And the threat to our youth um, and others in our community is clear. And so we want to see what the county can do. The other thing I wanted to acknowledge is that one of the um, proponents also um, included a, a uh, referral to the city council by council member um, Deb Davis. And I wanted to include that for our staff's benefit because I think the coordination between the city and the county is very important. So to make sure that the staff had an opportunity to review council member Davis's um, referral and perhaps work with the um, city of San Jose to get a better understanding of the actions they may take so that they can be as aligned as possible. And that would be my motion. So that is your motion for the referral. Do we have a second? I'll second it. Thank you, Supervisor Lee. We'll turn to the member of the public. David. One moment while we get the timer up, please. Thank you. Next speaker is Paul Soto. You have one minute. Please go ahead. Yes, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Um, well, knowing that uh, Deb Davis is behind this one or is being supported in this, that means that uh, white kids in Willow Glen are getting loaded on nitrous oxide. That's what that means. Because there's been, you know, there's been other issues. Like I said, there was uh, uh, 30, 30 deaths in August on the streets of fentanyl. Didn't hear nothing from Davis. Not a thing, not a word, not a peep, nothing. All of a sudden, all of a sudden, so there there must be some kid, some, some you know, some affluent kid that doesn't know how to get high on that now. So he goes, yeah, let's get some nice stocks, I dude. Yeah, let's try it. Yeah, all right, brother. And that's what, that's what they did. And these are the kinds of things that push policy, not morality, not ethics, not what's right, not what's just, but what is politically expedient. Thank you. Next speaker is Tessa Woodmancy. You have one minute. Please go ahead. Tessa, are you there? Okay, yeah, I'm here. Thank you so much. You hear me? Go ahead. Yeah. Okay, good. Thanks, sweetie. Um, all right. Well, I guess there was something um, about Deb Davis, and um, we were talking about that, and it's very important the the relationship with the city and the county as we really face a climate emergency how we need to coordinate with with our levels of government and i'm glad to hear you know deb davis being mentioned and in, uh, in regards to our san jose city uh, council members and how we need to coordinate um in terms of our, our the true crisis that we have which is our climate crisis and how we're going to stop burning fossil fuels and keep it in the ground, keep fossil fuels in the ground, and how it has to be a, uh, and, and that's the thing I was hoping for, is that the county would would support um, growing food in our community. We need to have, like Allery Middlebrook of Middlebrook Gardens says, 25 by 25, but we need gardens everywhere to grow food, so we have living with. Next speaker is Deanna Merzadegan. You have one minute. Please go ahead. I just wanted to uh, thank you again for the referral and for coordinating with the city. And um, I've read the referral and the um, coordination with the state because this, this egregious loophole needs to be closed within the state too. Um, something that is illegal to inhale and causes uh, dangerous harm to all kids of all, ethnicities, cultures, and backgrounds um, should not be sold in stores that specialize in inhalation and should be so accessible to our youth. Thank you. That concludes our request to speak. Thank you, David. I appreciate that. We have a motion and a second. I don't see any other hands raised for their discussion. David, roll call vote. Oh, Supervisor Lee. 
Yeah, since I second the motion, I just want to make a brief comment. First of all, I would like to thank uh, Supervisor Chavez to taking the leadership of uh, putting this referral of a uh, very important uh, uh, and, you know, questionably uh, 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 and very dangerous, actually, uh, uh, use of this uh, nitrous oxide. Um, as we have also learned from a previous news report, uh, it is commonly used, in this case, uh, the founder of Zappos, uh, Tony Shea, somebody who I've uh, fortunately met uh, a few years ago in Las Vegas, who has truly transformed the landscape of uh, downtown the Las Vegas a few years ago using his uh, 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 wealth and, uh, and knowledge and creativity. Uh, and his death is uh, shortened at the age of 46 because of this uh, substance. So I really do think this is something that we need to uh, uh, put a put a kibosh on. So thank you so much for uh, uh, Supervisor Chavez for leading this effort on this one. Thank you. Thank you. And David, before you take the vote, I'm just going to say to Dr. Smith, uh, Supervisor Chavez, I'm 100% in favor of this. I'm voting aye. What I'm raising here, Dr. Smith, for comments perhaps later is, to my knowledge, we have about 75 referrals on the books. And we keep adding referrals. I think there's half a dozen today. And at some point, I think we need to get into the discussion of prioritizing. You know, how do we do this referral? Does it go behind the other 75 that have been that are on the books from the last year or two. Um, I, Dr. Smith, I'm just giving you a heads up that at some point I'd like to agendize you speaking to the referral program and what resources you have to go do this one before or after the other 75. I, I think board members, that's a discussion that, that's worthwhile having um, at, at some point. We, we keep adding on referrals, which is great. I think this one is perfectly under the county's purview and it's appropriate but then i don't know if we assign staff to this ahead of the other ones where it goes anyway that that's my comment da uh, david roll call vote please supervisor lee aye supervisor chavez yes supervisor simidian aye vice president ellenberg yes. president wasserman yes as thank well thank you thank you very much we now move on to item 10 uh, with three possible referrals, and this is from Supervisor Chavez. Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. This item, item 10, is a um, an item that is really branching off of the lead screening of youth in juvenile hall and the ranch that was part of my uh, referral for the um, airborne lead study that and a vote we took on August 17th. Um, this this, uh, as studies have indicated, there's no safe um, blood lead level in children and early childhood exposure may lead to learning disabilities, ADHD and impulse control problems that can adversely impact a youth's behavior. This referral requests that the administration report back to the board on March 22nd with options relating to establishing standards of care protocols and mechanisms for lead screening of youth booked in uh, juvenile hall and protocols for sharing information relating to lead toxicity with impacted youth and the youth's families and caregivers. Two options to screen youth are already residing in the hall and the ranch for lead text. Uh, so item two is to um, is options for screening and then item three are resources needed um, possible funding. And pursuit of this I know will better provide us with um, better allow us to provide care for youth in our in our care and the adult additionally the screening can help inform if other children in the same household should be screened and lastly this will allow the county to proactively connect youth and their parents and caregivers to resources to address lead abatement um, colleagues i have one more addition the county has a lead safe homes program that i would like to better understand and would like to ask for an off agenda report in march describing the program in more detail and I'd like to ask um, support of my colleagues on this item. Thank you. We have a motion for item 10, uh, actions A, B, and C by the maker, Supervisor Chavez, and a second by Vice President Ellenberg. If it's all right with board members, we'll turn to the public now. David? One moment, please. Next speaker is Paul Soto. You have one minute, please go ahead. Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Uh, thank you, uh, President Wasserman, for that uh, check on the, uh, in terms of process. I appreciate that. Um, the report isn't clear in terms of what it is that uh, Supervisor Chavez is requesting. Is she implying that 
somehow or another these children's zip codes are somehow or another uh, predictable? Is, is, is that what she's saying? That the zip codes of those children that are in juvenile and the boys' ranch, that their zip code is predictable? Is that what she's implying? Or is she implying that juvenile hall itself, the environment, is infected with it and that the staff needs to also be tested? So I, I'm not really sure as to what, where she's going with this, but uh, I'd like some clarification on that. Thank you. Next speaker is Irvish. You have one minute. Please go ahead. Thank you very much to uh, Board of Supervisors again. Uh, with specific to the item number 10, uh, uh, what is required is a change in the narrative, a more uh, comprehensive and holistic ethnic studies program that helps the incarcerated youth to navigate the identity. Now it is important to understand and as well as put the, uh, put the emphasis on on the studies like African studies, American Indian studies, Asian American studies, Latino studies, and understanding about the comparative measure called race and resistance studies. This kind of introduction and induction of a program with its new collaboration with the, with the, with the juvenile justice division would help youth achieve the sense of identity and as well as sense of ethnicity within their own. Thank you very much for consideration of comments. Next speaker is Tony Romero. You have one minute, please go ahead. Um, hi, uh, good afternoon, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, my name is Tony Romero. I'm a community organizer with Latinos United for New America. Uh, and I'm just talking uh, here to support uh, Supervisor Ch Chavez referral uh, and start testing out youth uh, that are in juvenile hall uh, for lead. And it's really important uh, that these uh, uh, juveniles start having the resources uh, and have the, uh, the prevention uh, for lead poisoning in, in, in these spaces. Um, thank you very much. Next speaker is Myra. You have one minute. Please go ahead. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Mara Pelagio, and I am working with Latino United for New America as well. And I want to thank Supervisor Chavez for all of her leadership that she has brought up with uh, lead testing and lead prevention uh, as well. And I want to ask you to approve the referral and start testing all of the youth in juvenile hall, as well as provide all of the resources that they and their caregivers need to prevent lead exposure. Um, this is an issue that is really close to the outreach needed for families uh, exposed to the airborne lead in the neighborhoods surrounded Red Hillview Airport. And we need to ensure the distribution of resources for these families, including the youth. Um, I also want to encourage you to support the Little League and provide funding for their operations for the next three years and in the future and support their relocation to an area that is um, not as in close proximity to Red Hillview as well. Thank you all so much for your time. Next speaker is Waskar Castro. You have one minute. Please go ahead. Um, hello, President Wasserman and members of the board. My name is Waskar Castro, Associate Director of Housing and Transportation Policy and Working Partnerships. Uh, first, I'd like to thank Supervisor Chavez for her leadership on this issue. Um, we all know that no amount of lead is a safe amount of lead, so we must do everything possible to ensure that we're getting folks tested and getting folks services they need and really work hard combating um, overall lead exposure. Uh, for that reason, um, we're proud to support um, this referral uh, so that we can ensure that um, uh, folks that are in our juvenile system are getting the services and health service and health care that they need um, and also have the ability to potentially screen for um, lead exposure. Uh, also, uh, in addition, we'd like to reiterate the comments made uh, by Mayra Pelagio from Luna about ensuring that we're keeping all our communities safe and where there's currently a little league, um, ensuring that um, we are having a safe space for them, knowing that lead exposure is currently um, going on. Thank you. Next speaker is Juan Estrada. You have one minute, please go ahead. Hi, uh, dear supervisors. My name is Juan Estrada and I'm speaking today as president of District 5 United, which strives to improve the quality of life in East San Jose during your August 17th 2021 board meeting, you voted unanimously to approve uh, the referral for lead screening in juvenile hall. Uh, I urge you to approve the referral today 
for lead screening at juvenile hall and the ranch. Uh, this will help ensure youth entering the hall and those already residing in the hall will be tested for no harm and provided with the information they need for them and their caregivers to mitigate any lead exposure at home, uh, including with other younger children. Uh, I urge you to, again, to approve the referral, start the testing. We need to understand the potential impact, uh, the extent of lead harm to these kids that may uh, be impacting behavior. Um, thank you. And that concludes our request to speak. Thank you, David. Supervisor Chavez. Thank you, um, colleagues. I, I just wanted to respond to a couple of issues that were raised. One is, I'll, just to sunshine this, I'll be bringing a referral forward relative to the Little League that currently operates out at the um, Reed Hillview um, site in a couple of weeks. So I really appreciate the public raising concerns about making sure they have a safe space and that they have a place that they can move to. So thank you very much for that. And then the only other thing I wanted to add is that I, I do want to reinforce that it is true that we gave direction um, during the um, August meeting. That direction wasn't clearly communicated throughout the staff and Supervisor Wasserman. One point I would just make is that I, I think you raise a good point about the referral process and then what happens to referrals once the board takes action on them. So thank you for for raising that. So colleagues, I would very much appreciate an, um, a yes vote on this item. Thank you. I don't see any other hands raised, so I'll make some concluding comments of my own before we take a vote. Um, I think this idea is intriguing to find out where youth have higher have led in their blood. Um, I think ultimately to see a countywide map, maybe with pins, with dots, whatever it is that's produced from this study, whatever other information is available throughout the county, school districts or whatever that could supply us with information. We did a lead study um, based on the airport and blood samples. I'm very happy now that currently anyway, uh, all five of our gas tanks contain unleaded gas at our two county airports. Uh, that's a move in the right direction. I think it's also gonna be interesting to see if lead emissions are found in the ground, if they're found in the paint, if they're found in the water. So as we identify where lead is in the blood of youth throughout Santa Clara County, I think that will be extremely helpful in remedying, eliminating the lead that's there, not just for the current generations, but for generations to come. So I will be supporting this motion as I think it's opening the door to a countywide uh, look at where there is lead in the, youth, in the blood of our youth. All right, if we may, David, roll call vote, please. Uh, President Wasserman, forgive me. Um, I, I seem to have missed the mover and seconder on this item. Could you reiterate who that was, sure. please? Mover Supervisor Chavez, and I believe the second was Vice President Ellenberg. Thank you. I, I appreciate the clarification. Thank you. Uh, Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. President Wasserman. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Dr. Smith, you heard what Supervisor Chavez said. These motions were asking for responses back in 35, 36 days, roughly five weeks. Um, so I need at some point, Dr. Smith, for you to present to the board how you handle things like this. I believe we've given you five referrals so far. So we, we need to have a discussion on how that is managed. With that, we move on to item number 11. And this is a referral from Supervisor Chavez. Supervisor Chavez, go ahead. Thank you so much. And thank you, colleagues. Um, President Wasserman, I don't think we have any public speakers. So this referral is requesting the administration to return with continued support for the important work being done by Maranatha um, uh, Bible Way and Emmanuel Baptist Churches. This is a request to identify funds to support the requested action, uh, which is to continue to support a multi-year contract through June, 2025. To, and to provide resources so students as they make up for educational and developmental gaps, both caused by the pandemic, but items, issues that were raised um, even prior to the pandemic. Thank you.
President Wasserman, you're muted, sir. Thank you very much. Vice President Ellenberg, I see your hand raised. We have a few members from the public. Would you like to speak before or after? I'm happy to make a second. I do have um, a few questions that, that I would, and just clarifying questions that I would like to ask Supervisor Chavez. Why don't you go ahead with the questions so our public can benefit from those answers? Thank you very much. Uh, my my first question is that um, is a clarification with regard to Bay Area Tutoring Association. They were part of the initial um, referral for this work. There's a comment in the referral that um, that says that that contract is going directly to procurement. But I, I wonder if you could just explain what you had in mind. So on that. Um that I, I presumed would be included because it had been included in the last um, package, but the, the other three organizations came and said that they needed continued funding. So my thinking was that this would be something that staff would investigate further with the, the provider because they hadn't reached out. That makes sense. So are you open to including that? I'm happy to, I, I think I seconded it. Okay. Including yeah. direction that they, that they reach out there. It looks like Dr. Smith might have a, a faster explanation. Dr. Yeah. Smith? Dr. Yeah. Dr. Either, Smith. You can go either way. Um, the procurement director has authority to do the contract directly with them within the context of... Somebody talking in the background within the context of uh, his authority. So either way would be fine as long as we have the intent that the board wants, wants to include them in the motion, that's fine. Absolutely, I'm, I'm happy to make that included. Thank you. Thank you so much. And the other procedural question, and maybe this is for Dr. Smith too, is that this, this is a multi-year request. Um, what does that look like in terms of budgeting since I, generally understand that we budget for one year at a time unless something is going into the base budget and is permanently a part of our budget as permanent as anything is we budget a year at a time but if we enter into a contract with the providers uh, the contract uh, requires us to include it in subsequent budgets um, so the board could in the future defund it in subsequent budgets, but uh, typically that does not happen. Right. Okay, that answers my questions. Thank you very much. And thank you, Supervisor Travis, for including uh, Bay Area Tutoring once again. Absolutely. Thank you. David, if we can hear from the public, please. Certainly. One moment, please. Next speaker is Paul Soto. You have one minute. Please go ahead. Uh, yes, Paul Soto from Horseshoe. I'd like to thank those uh, churches for the service that they provide to the community. They were the first ones that were involved in the uh, reentry programs back when uh, AB 109 kicked off. So I, I, I want to thank them for that. One thing that I would like to add, though, is that and there's a documentary called The Kids We Lost, and it's about the school to prison pipeline. And in that documentary, it articulated specifically that, you know, there's predictable outcomes for kids that are, have academic or behavioral issues in the third grade. Okay, this and this is knowledge that has been uh, it in, uh, it's been used in academia and also mortgage companies and banks because they lend money against those numbers. So when you're budgeting for these uh, budget allocations, there has to be that element to it because these kids in these elementary schools right now they are vulnerable. They are on track to go to prison right now, and this county has to take assume at least some. The next speaker is Walter Wilson. You have one minute. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Board of Supervisors, for supporting this important program. I just wanted to let you know that this is more than a tutoring program. These institutions, Bible Way Christian Center, Maranatha Christian Center, and Emmanuel Baptist Church, that have, have taken it upon themselves to bring this healing to these communities. It's far beyond academics. The, the types of um, work that's being done there is about nutrition and meals that they're feeding to these kids, and not just the kids, but their families are also receiving support when these institutions find out that they need it. They're also connecting them to other county and other resources. And I think one of the most important things is the spiritual enrichment that they're receiving. The idea that this is far more than academics, this is about whole person care. 
and about whole person love. And I appreciate your support for these programs and your continued support for them. And I think it's very important that we continue to support programs like this and even more as we bring other African African centered churches and programs online. Thank you so much. Thank you, Walter. The next speaker is Irvish. You have one minute. Please go ahead. Thank you very much uh, uh, again, board, to Board of Supervisors for uh, the COVID-19 uh, topic and as well as the children's roadmap for recovery from the COVID-19. Uh, it is to note here that uh, after the initiatives that has been taken uh, for specifically for the children's ages five to 11, then, you know, having, you know, the COVID-19 vaccination requirements to place and to be also to be implemented, implemented by the Public Health Commission for particularly with the cases of the children, there are less, there are fewer than 95% of I, ICU beds that's been uh, uh, occupied, that's been reported, as well as the COVID-19 hospital, hospitalization rate and the community positivity rate that is below the 5%. And these are the metrics that, that is to be uh, something, you know, to be uh, exhibited by the Public Health uh, Commission with regards to the uh, with the children ages 5 to 11. Also, it is mentally Next speaker is Loriana Gardier. You have one minute. Please go ahead. Hi, I'm Loriana Gardier. I'm the director at Destiny Academy at Bible Way. But I wanted to speak as a parent today. I have a second grader and a kindergarten and kindergartner and Black parents in this valley have a challenge in finding cultural representation in schools. And it's not uncommon for our students to be the only Black students in the classroom. And it's so important that our kids see themselves in their cultural and their educational experience. We at Destiny have several Black male educators. Our mental wellness spaces are conducted by Black therapists, and more than 70% of our students are Black and Brown. My kids engage in these learning sessions much differently than they do in school. Sharing a cultural identity with most of the students in there and staff give our kids confidence and a sense of belonging that aids in their ability to learn. So we really want to help close this achievement gap at Bible Way Maranatha and Emmanuel. We're building community together, and we hope that you continue to support our programs. Thank you so much. Next speaker is Aaron Eccles. You have one minute. Please go ahead. Um, my name is Aaron Eccles. I am a homeschooler and father of four and credentialed educator, and I am the educational coordinator for Book Destiny and now Legacy Academies. And just today, I just wanted to emphasize the specific approach that African American youth need to be successful, and we must be encouraged by people that look like us. Uh, we provide that space, and we've been doing that for over 27 years. Um, and also, specifically, one of the biggest things we're doing for our community which is being requested by uh, and from, from school district is our mental wellness piece. We provide this free for our community and it's one of the biggest things that I've seen take our kids out of the school to death pipeline. Um, some people call it the school to prison pipeline, but I see it the school to death pipeline. Um, lastly, I would like to say that we've already had a healthy relationship with success with you guys. Um, we were cut our funds before the pandemic, but we can pick up the mantle again if we are funded again. The next speaker is Anthony Williams. You have one minute, please go ahead. Yes, this is Dr. Tony Williams, founder and pastor emeritus of Maranatha Christian Center and Maranatha Outreach Center. We've operated uh, the Book Academy along with the other uh, churches for the last 29 years. Uh, we've served kids for year round school. We've served them every Tuesday and Thursday. Uh, we send vans to pick up children at certain de designated locations. Um, we bring them, we provide them with computer uh, skills and a computer learning center, as well as uh, excellent tutoring. We then feed them a dinner meal and sometimes send food home for the families as well. We want to continue to be funded so that we can continue to reach our community. Uh, COVID has left a dearth with our children who have tried to be educated by computers, uh, but have failed. We would like to make that gap up through our tutorial services. Thank you very much. Next speaker is Pastor Jason Reynolds. You have one minute, please go ahead. Hello, thank you, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. 
Wonderful. Uh, this is Pastor Jason Reynolds, the pastor of the Emmanuel Baptist Church and currently helping to direct the program of Legacy Academy. I want to echo what has already been spoken uh, about the importance of these programs, but also add a small story. Uh, a young man that was coming to our group, uh, we were doing everything virtually, uh, just wouldn't talk. He would keep showing up, but would not speak, would not do anything, but slowly but surely came out of a shell started to smile, started to get excited about the education, and he wouldn't talk because he was so far behind in his educational and academic achievement. But as he started making those achievements, then he came out of the shell, started doing better in school, and started doing better at home. These things work, these opportunities work, and being surrounded in, in environments that encourage you, that reflect you, are so needed for our young people. So I hope that you all will agree with us and support us to continue to do the work we do. Thank you. That concludes our request to speak. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. David, I'll turn to Supervisor Smitty. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, it just occurred to me as we were listening to the speakers that um, our county has, at least in recent years, uh, and our county council, just to uh, engage their attention for a minute, uh, has been quite mindful of the fact that faith-based organizations can and do uh, often have the ability to reach uh, every corner of the community in a way that others might not. On the other hand, we do have an obligation to respect uh, church-state separation. And so I just want to ask county council's office, as they have in the past, to make sure that any contract language, including amendments or extensions, uh, specifically calls out the uh, church state issues that our contract language has been sensitive to in the past and ask uh, through uh, Dr. Smith and administration that as the procurement process proceeds, the importance of making sure these services are truly available to all um, is underscored for all providers. Thank you very much. Thank you. I look for any other hands. <clears throat> I don't see any. Sir, so submitting your hand is still up. Down. All right, we are good. And this is a, to bring back on March 22nd. And the previous one was three others for March 22nd. And I think item number nine was March 22nd. Um, I'm just going to ask at this point, if you don't mind, Supervisor Chavez, Dr. Smith, we've, we're going to be adding on about seven more referrals all to come back on March 22nd. I'll just flat out ask you, is that possible? That's about 10% of the referrals we already have in the queue. The more time you give us, the better off uh, the response will be. I won't say it's impossible, but um, you know the standard pattern in the past, in the board rules has been 45 days to respond to a uh, referral, which we uh, cheated on many times in the last few years. But okay. um, thank you. I'll uh, ask Supervisor Chavez, the referrals that we've done and the ones coming up March 22nd, it's 35 days. Is that still your desire, that date? I would say yes, but I think we've also been really flexible when the staff says they can't they can't make that date. Um, and the other thing I'll just point out is that some, most of the referrals, at least that uh, colleagues that I bring forward, um, I've reviewed with um, both the staff and council before I bring them to you, including the date that's included. Uh, but, you know, so that's, that's the, you know, our standard, my office's um, approach. But like I said, if the staff can't make the date, they'll let us, they'll let us know that. And okay. Thank you very much. David, with that, please take a roll call vote. Forgive me, I was muted. Supervisor Lee? Aye. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Aye. Vice President Ellenberg? Yes. And President Wasserman? Yes, as well. Thank, Thank you. you. Board members, what I'd like to do is shoot for a lunch break at 12, come back at one. Um, item number 12, 13 will take some time. If it's okay with you, I'm going to see if county executive, if you have a report. Item 15. Dr. Smith. Yes, um, I wanted to give um, a little bit of an update about 
the public health mandates that you've been talking about or that have been please, discussed. Please. First of all, um, <clears throat> I wanted to clarify the state's mandates. Um, although it's been reported in the newspaper that all the mask mandates have been uh, lifted, that's not actually true. The state continues to have mandatory masking for children in schools and also for unvaccinated individuals in uh, public or uh, in public settings, both in indoors and outdoors. Um, the local order expands that a little bit into the unvaccinated population in public settings. Um, the reason for the expansion has to do with the previously determined three criteria, um, which um, have not quite been met yet. Uh, those three criteria are stabilization of the case rate, um, in certain uh, maximization of vaccines, and uh, the, uh, sorry. We lost you. Dr. Smith, so, there you sorry. go. I'm sorry. Uh, no worries. So I'm cutting out over here. So the three criteria were uh, vaccine rates, hospitalization, and stabilization of uh, case rates. The case rate issue is the only one which we're not quite meeting at this point. We continue to have significant number of cases and actually uh, the number of deaths um, per day is going up a little bit. Um, the pandemic's not over in the state, thousand individuals dying a day. Um, and uh, most of the state is not vaccinated anywhere near as well as Santa Clara. That being said, I think we will probably meet the case rate requirements soon. Um, although, you know, every time we're trying to predict something with this pandemic, it's been hard to predict. So that's um, one, um, one mandate, a uh, local mandate. The second is the mandate for boosters in certain high risk situations, hospitals, clinics, uh, uh, jails, um, first responders, um, child care, those kinds of areas. And we've been watching the uh, rates of vaccination for employees in those areas from the county employees, that is, is what I should say, those areas. We now have about 17 um, undocumented, I mean, not documented, 17 fire employees who do not have documentation of boosters. However, of that number, 13 are on medical leave for other reasons. And um, the others are in the process of being evaluated. Um, nobody has been fired. Uh, everybody's being encouraged to get vaccinated. With regard to custody setting, it's a little bit more, it's in the 20 range, um, but also a number of those have been put on uh, leave and are being uh, evaluated. We've seen no significant uh, risk of uh, staffing in either setting. So we're continuing to push for vaccination. Uh, with that, I think uh, that's about all I need to say and uh, questions. Thank you, Vice President Ellenberg. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Smith. I just want to make a clarification, um, perhaps for the public, because there's um, there's still confusion amongst the the roles of all of us here. And though you just gave a report on where we are on the metrics, I want to make clear that you as the CEO and accountable to the board it are not is not the person that makes the public health orders that is done by the public health officer by Dr. Cody and what you were doing was was just sort of some explanation but not um, 
not making or rescinding orders. Is that correct? Correct. Both orders and any subsequent or previous orders are all at the discretion of the public health officer, which is not me, it's Dr. Cody. Um, I was just reporting because the board and public had had some questions about where we stand um, and make sure that the board got the right information about the state. The state also has the ability to have their own orders and uh, I was trying to explain both and the interaction between both. Perfect. Thank you so much. And I think you you explained well. I just wanted the, the public to understand the, the distinction between the roles. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Chavez. Thank you, um, Dr. Smith. Um, I want to just take you to the last um, point that you raised that um, we have approximately 17 members of the of our fire department who don't have documentation of the booster. And you said that 13 of them are on a medical leave now for other other non COVID related um, reasons. Yes. So that these individuals um, could well be vaccinated. They just have been on leave, so they might not have done the documentation or downloaded the evidence of their vaccination. But we don't begin to look um, at any kind of discipline or information sharing until they come back from leave. And um, thank you. And what that means is that we have four people that um, that are in the status of being, uh, we don't have documentation about them being boosted or vaccinated. We have four that have, uh, that are in active duty that have refused the booster or vaccination and we're working them with them through the disciplinary process to get them vaccinated. Um, they have multiple opportunities to get vaccinated. And these are our staff that previously had a medical exemption or a religious exemption? I don't accurately have that number because there have been, I can't speak for these four people, but just in general, there have been some people who have had a uh, medical or a religious exemption to be vaccinated, period. And then we have had a few in the county who have requested uh, exemptions after they got their first set of vaccinations and to be exempt from boosters. But again, I can't speak to these four individuals because I don't have that information. In front of me. Thank you. And, um, and as we're speaking about, um, I'm just wanting to hone in on one thing that you said at the end, where, which is you comment that, commented that nobody is being fired. And what I'm, what I'm curious about, I mean, I just want to make sure that that's, that that's accurate. And if that is accurate, I'm presuming that that covers the custody staff and fire as well. Is that accurate? They, they're going through the discipline process. They've not been fired or terminated yet. They get a notice and an opportunity for a Skelly hearing. They have a process, due process, then they can appeal that process. Um, so it's a long process to terminate somebody. And so this is related to both custody and fire? Both have similar rights, yes. Thank you. And um, and Dr. Smith, the again, both for custody and fire, just again, so I, I understand this, that these are for for somebody to still be employed with us um, throughout the two years, they um, either were um, they had a they had a religious or a um, uh, a medical exemption. And then we had a testing mandate for them. Is that accurate? Yes, that's accurate. Or, well, I should add one thing. Some of them were reasonably accommodated to other jobs, but right. generally you're right. So, and that, that, and that actually, I'm, I'm glad you brought up reason, reasonable accommodation because that was my understanding for employees really throughout the organization 
um, to be protective of their health and the health of their colleagues. Correct. Correct. Thank you. Um, what what I just first of all, I really appreciate the report out, and I really do appreciate Supervisor Ellenberg just drawing that delineation as people listen so that they understand, you know, where we are in our process. I do just want to um, raise a concern, and again, just about the mental health of our um, our employees. And I do appreciate, Dr. Smith, that you're keeping a very strong eye on the um, the ability of our organization to respond to high need situations, including fires and other, um, you know, natural disasters that we also have to be prepared for. And what I would just say, um, again, um, to my colleagues is that I'm hopeful that we will begin to align with the state. I, I have a lot of confidence in Dr. Cody and our team's um, concern about the the way we're addressing this relative to the science. And I appreciate that we've been following the science. Um, I'm also mindful that we are um, also dealing with a very fatigued public and a fatigued workforce and wanna make sure that as much as possible that we're simplifying our approach and our rules as, as we proceed. Um, so, um, and Dr. Smith, I'm, I'm also just acknowledging that you are the decider about the strain on our workforce, both um, the custody workforce and the um, firefighting workforce, that, and that is informed by Sheriff Smith and informed by Brian Glass, but ultimately you are deciding whether or not we have a strain on our, our staffing resources. Is that accurate? Yeah, the limited waiver process was set up so that um, the I could, in this situation, apply for a waiver. The waiver still would have to be approved by the public health officer, but she's been very lenient with the others. So we're watching closely and we would make a request if we thought there was a problem. I should also clarify uh, while I've got the microphone. Um, one custody deputy previously refused to get the first series of vaccinations and the second booster and did not fill out a request for exemption. And that person was uh, separated because they didn't comply with even requesting the exemption. So I want to clarify that. that. That wasn't because of the booster mandate. That was because of a uh, refusal to comply with uh, the request for a mandate or for an exemption. Thank you. And I, I did want to just thank you for that clarification, Dr. Smith. And I did just want to rem, um, remind staff that I asked for a list of all the requested waivers and which ones had been granted and look forward to receiving that. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you. Supervisor Lee. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Smith, for the explanation and clarifying uh, of the three conditions, uh, namely the vaccination rate, the hospitalization rate, and the case rate. And if I understand correctly, I know our vaccine rate is phenomenal. We are the number one in terms of vaccination of all the large counties. So great, we met that already. So no issue there. Uh, and you mentioned something about hospitalization rate. So uh, has our rate of hospitalization and slash death has come to the point where we have already met that uh, criteria, so I just wanted some clarification. The, the question? Oh yeah, the question was uh, right. the three oh, criteria. Yeah. I believe the third one's not met yet, the case rate, but I believe the hospitalization rate, we are meeting it. So I just want to double check and make sure that's correct. Yeah, our, our vaccination rate is very high, the highest of the large, large counties in the nation. Um, our hospitalization rate is low, um, but our where we're failing to meet the measure is in the case rate. Mm -hmm. That okay. being said, just like the state, we're assessing, and you know we're trying to protect a large volume of unvaccinated kids and elders and people with immune deficiencies. Great. Thank you. No, thank you. All right, we'll consider that item number 15. I'm gonna get a report from County Council, then we are going to adjourn until one o'clock. Mr. Williams.
There were no reportable actions taken at the closed session meeting of February 14, 2022, and that concludes my report. Thank you very much. Board members, we are going to return to, uh, when we come back at one o'clock, we're going to start with item number 12, then 13, then 17, and then we've got uh, 18 and 19 along with seven others. So I will see you all at one o'clock. Recording stopped.
Recording in progress. David, you there? I am here, sir. Good afternoon. Wonderful. Good afternoon. Hope you were able to get a lunch. I was. Thank you. All right. You're one welcome. I see Vice President and I see Supervisor Chavez, Supervisor Lee. I see it's 12.59 for about three more seconds. I'll look for Supervisor Simidian. He is signed on. His video is not on. OK, wonderful. Present, though. He's present, though. Let's take a roll call and start with number 12. Good afternoon, Supervisor Lee. Good afternoon, Lee present. Supervisor Chavez. Here. Supervisor Simidian. Here. Vice President Ellenberg. I'm here. And President Wasserman. Here as well. Thank, Thank you, you very much. We're going to resume this meeting with item number 12, which is one, two, three, four referrals brought forth by Supervisor Chavez and Vice President Ellenberg. Who would like to speak first on this item? I'm happy to, to start um, with gratitude to Supervisor Chavez for partnering with me to introduce this important referral today that addresses the needs of our county's children in the shadow of the COVID-19 pandemic response and recovery. This referral addresses several critical elements around COVID recovery for kids in Santa Clara County. First, uh, it addresses the need for specific supports for kids who have lost a parent or a primary caregiver due to COVID-19. Second, it uh, takes a look at the expansion of wellness centers on school sites to promote mental health and well being. And third, it focuses on tools for the recovery of the early learning and childcare workforce that is essential to child learning and the ability of families to return to work. And uh, similar to what I, I said earlier today, as the county balances our continued responses to minimize severe illness and death with an eye toward recovery, we believe that the county has a particular obligation to address the recovery needs of children who may face lifelong challenges due to the loss of a parent or primary caregiver. National, element, national estimates developed prior to the Omicron wave indicate that one in every 450 children in the U.S. under, the 18, under, the, under 18 years of age has lost a parent or a primary caregiver who was living in their household due to the COVID pandemic. These rates are more than twice as high for Black and Latino children. That is more than 167,000 children across the US, nearly 27,000 of whom live in California. Santa Clara County's robust COVID-19 response has reduced the number of local deaths through preventative action. Yet more than 2,000 residents of our county died due to COVID-19. It's not a stretch to believe that among these individuals were parents, custodial grandparents, and primary caregivers to kids under 18. We've already discussed at length the need for increased mental health support services for children and teens, and wellness services are an important piece of that support web. And finally, the pandemic launched the already struggling childcare industry into a full-fledged crisis with significant consequences for county residents. As the pandemic forced thousands of daycare centers across the country to close or reduce hours, the childcare workforce lost hundreds or thousands of jobs. Parents struggling to find affordable and safe childcare left the workforce altogether or reduced their working hours due to disruptions in childcare. To reopen safely or to remain in business, childcare providers continue to face steep costs associated with reduced enrollment, heightened sanitation measures, and workforce shortages. I know that all of my colleagues recognize the importance of high quality childcare as a foundation to healthy development in young kids that boosts their long-term educational and employment outcomes. The flip side of that is that lack of access to affordable quality childcare represents a common barrier for low-income parents seeking access to employment. Programs to invest in training and retention for the childcare workforce similarly offer pathways to more sustainable employment in that profession. I'm joining this meeting today from Washington, DC, 
where I'm participating in the legislative conference uh, put on by the National Association of Counties. And I have really been struck by the number of workshops and seminars this year that are focusing on federal, state, and local policy levers for, for stabilizing the childcare industry. This is a primary issue facing urban, suburban, and rural counties in red, blue, and purple states. And we have an opportunity to do our part. The referral is multi-pronged, but it's interconnected. The three requests highlight where the greatest need for children's recovery lies. While we know that ARPA is just a piece of how some of this direction could be funded, I wanna remind my colleagues that counties uh, can, and, and very, very many have, invest in invest recovery funds in a broad range of programs, services, and projects under five categories to support the public health response, to address the negative economic impacts caused by COVID, to replace lost revenue, to provide premium pay to essential workers, and invest in water, sewage, sewer, and broadband infrastructure. My colleagues at NACO and CSAC have shared how they have invested their ARPA funding and I was pleased to learn that nearly 70% of county plans include investments in human services, children, and families. And while kids have generally been less directly impacted by severe illness, they have borne some of the most significant burdens of the pandemic, ranging from school disruptions, loss of social connections, and the stress of changing family economic circumstances. We have a core role to play in stabilizing families and supporting their well being. A small number of families have faced the most tragic impacts with a loss of a parent or a primary caregiver. We've been a leader in our response to the pandemic, providing relief for our businesses and isolation supports for our workers. We must also respond to the short and long-term needs of our families. If this referral is approved today, and of course I, I hope it will be, I want to ensure that the report back will be presented to the board in time to be considered in the May budget workshops, which likely means the first meeting in April, but I'll, I'll leave that to Dr. Smith, whether it's the first or second. I wanna thank administration in advance for their continued partnership with key stakeholders in the work outlined, including the County Office of Ed, First Five, our community colleges, Healthier Kids Foundation, and of course, our many, many county departments that touch the lives of children. With that, I will make a motion to approve the referral. Thank you for that very comprehensive description. And it's a, Chavez. thank you. And it's four referrals here. Supervisor Chavez, did you have anything that you wanted to add on to what Vice President Ellenberg said at this time, or should we hear from the public? I'd love to hear from the public, and then I'll make a couple of comments. Thank you. Thank you. And again, this is simply four referrals. Uh, David, let's do two minutes each. All right, one moment, please, while we adjust the timer. Thank you. We'll have that up in just a moment. The first speaker is early learning. Please accept the unmute. You have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Hi. Um, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Oh, fantastic. I'm Dr. Heidi Emberling, Deputy Chief of Early Learning for First Five Santa Clara County, and I'd like to express my gratitude to Supervisors Ellenberg and Chavez and the entire Board of Supervisors for elevating the needs of our diverse child care community, who truly are the unsung heroes of this pandemic. These small businesses were among the first to reopen and provide essential care for children so their parents could work. It's our turn now to support them in their work. With universal pre-K mandates coming down from the state, our county has an opportunity to bolster this critical sector. Simply put, we need more teachers. Families need access to quality care all day and year round. So what are we doing? First Five and our partners are prioritizing equity as we work to align efforts between school districts and early educators to provide a full day of wraparound care. We're working with community colleges and employers on an innovative apprenticeship pathway to bring new people into our field with guaranteed jobs and training. And we're looking for ways to incentivize, prepare, and support new and expanded family child care home micro businesses to meet increased demand from working families. We are ready to stand with you as we work together to rebuild and strengthen the care economy that supports working families across our county. Thank you so much for prioritizing families, children, and those who care for them. 
Next speaker is Jasmine Velasquez. I'm unmuting you. You have two minutes. Please go ahead. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Jasmine. I'm a parent advocate with Healthier Kids Foundation. Healthier Kids Foundation has been conducting emotional wellness checks among fifth graders in Santa Clara County. Of the 1,800 students we've screened this year, 47% have been identified as having unmet emotional and mental health needs, with 2% 2 being emergent cases. Let that sink in for a moment. 47% have been identified as having unmet emotional and mental health needs. The team and I follow up with the parents of these students to assist them in obtaining supportive services for their children. A common thread we've identified among these parents is that they are struggling both to support their ch children and themselves. We worked with one father who came to the United States with two of his three daughters just before COVID hit. At that time, he was working to bring his youngest daughter and wife to the US to unite the family. Then COVID hit, the border shut down, and immigration offices closed. He has been supporting his two children who have been separated from their mother and sister for two years. This family needs support. Thank you for recognizing how critical mental health services are to our community at this time. Thank you. Next speaker is CC. I'm unmuting you. You have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Yes, hi. Good afternoon, supervisors. This is Christy Connors with Bay Area Freedom Alliance. We're a coalition of concerned citizens in Santa Clara County with over a thousand members. And we're asking you to end all COVID measures immediately. This, the damage your prevention measures are doing to kids and families beyond the damage of COVID. You can end this tomorrow by rescinding the state of emergency, but you refuse to. Instead of ending the state of emergency and stopping the mandates, you're ruining families by taking away their basic human right to earn an income. The vaccine mandate and pending and booster mandate is impeding the hiring of first responders, but also caregivers and teachers. No one wants to go to work and be forced to get vaccinated and boosted constantly. Children must be prioritized. And when their parents are being put out of work, we are not able to do that. Mandates are not rooted in science. On January 20th of 2022, MSN reported on an announcement made by the CDC director, Rochelle Walensky. She said, COVID vaccines can't prevent transmission anymore. This should have been enough to end the booster, booster mandate in Santa Clara County, but it wasn't. As of today, an article from the New York Post dropped with the headline saying, science shows vaccine mandates are no longer necessary, yet our county refuses to listen to science and continues to double down. We from Bay Area Freedom Alliance call on the supervisors to do these following things immediately. One, end the state of emergency in Santa Clara County. Two, strip all power from Dr. Cody, AKA Nurse Ratchet, to implement executive orders relating to COVID. Number three, COVID is no longer a pandemic or an emergency. It is now endemic and should be treated as such. Your mandates are not rooted in science. Please end them immediately. Thank you. Next speaker is Urbish. You have two minutes. Please go ahead. Thank you very much to uh, Board of Supervisors uh, as well as the, uh, the county staff. Uh, I wanted to again, you know, emphasize on what we call as a pandemic and versus what we call endemic. Uh, the differentiation between the both is that when any particular, any unforeseen events or calamities or a disaster that happens, it takes uh, several years to come out of such situation. Let's not make sure that you know we are not living in a taboo, and it may not be a, the COVID nineteen has been proven for long, not just for California. It is the case for the entire world. That's why it is a pandemic. When going from a process from a pandemic to endemic, it takes a task and every individual that counts. And it takes an effort from a, not just from a public health official, it takes an effort from the entire administration that includes city, county, state, and countries administration to work alongside on a day-to-day -day basis to ensure that seniors, veterans, middle class, children, they able to receive the right set of a health care as a part of the medication, the resources, the education, and the awareness to be received. With the COVID-19 pandemic situation, it is, it is such an evident that you know, everybody has been remained uh, within the close content of working through virtually and as well as through the distant learning program. However, that has not left uh, the part of a fact that after the COVID-19 vaccination has been provided and the, the type of a guidance and the mandates that has been created allow the citizens to maintain the social distancing and living the regular life as it is. However, 
the impact you know which has left would require the behavior uh, the awareness and education resources to be created within the uh within the different jurisdiction with the behavioral and mental health there are numerous assembly bills senate bills are out there however next speaker is patricia alonzo you have two minutes please go ahead hello my name is patricia alonzo i'm the manager of the parent advocates at healthier kids foundation my team and I are thrilled that the county is proposing supportive services to children who will have lost a parent slash caretaker to COVID. At Healthier Kids Foundation, we identify students who have unmet health needs and work with their parents to get them into appropriate care. Unfortunately, we have worked with many families who have lost a loved one and are in need of critical support. We recently spoke with a mother who was struggling since losing her husband six months ago due to COVID. The mother does not speak English and she had relied on her husband for everything. Doctor's appointments, medical insurance, bills, school activities, parent-teacher conferences, he handled, he handled it all. She, will she was never worried for her kids and their well-being and now she is trying to raise two boys on her own and is afraid. There are many barriers that exist for this population, including language. As two-thirds of Two thirds of children in Santa Clara County have one parent born outside of the United States. And of course, there is still stigma that, that exists around accessing counseling services. These obstacles can be overwhelming, discouraging, and real a real challenge for parents. Thank you for recognizing how critical mental health services are to our community at this time. Thank you for your time. Next speaker is Carolyn Gray. You have two minutes, please go ahead. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Carolyn Gray uh, from the Government Relations Division at the Santa Clara County Office of Education. We support establishing a children's roadmap for recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic in Santa Clara County. Additional resources and supports are urgently needed in Santa Clara schools to help address the children's mental health crisis exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. Five decades of research indicates that children are 10 to 21 times more likely to receive the behavioral health services they need when they are provided on a school campus. Thank you for taking the time to address this important issue today. Next speaker is David Montiel. You have two minutes, please go ahead. David, are you there? Your mic is unmuted, but we cannot hear you. Oh, sorry, can you hear me? Go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, uh, I've been, uh, basically this whole pandemic has turned me into a freedom rights activist. And I've talked to Cindy Chavez before a long time ago uh, in uh, early uh, 2020. Um, and first of all, I do agree that we do need help. And I agree that it's good for the supervisors here and uh, for our county to help people by that have, have been affected from the, the pandemic, like you know, kids and families and stuff that you're talking to now. But we have to look about the too little too late situation that's been happening. First of all, uh, when I talked to, uh, I, I emailed uh, Supervisor Ellenberg, and she basically says, basically says she's not responsible for, uh, you know, the county as far as the pandemic. Well, when you hire a representative or vote in a representative, part of that responsibility is to uh, take care of your constituency for things that you might not agree with. And that really needs to be addressed. And so I'm going to address that right now. So what I'm trying to say is we need to really think about it because Dr. Cody talked about balance, but I don't see balance. I see Dr. Smith and other people, you know, trying to get firefighters to force the vaccination on them. They're losing their jobs. Oh, no, they're not losing their jobs. Yes, they are losing their jobs. I know people that have quit the nursing, the nursing <clears throat> and doctors that have quit. Okay, over the pandemic. So let's not let's not uh, you know act like this doesn't you know the county you know everything's smooth. The, you, I think we put we really did put uh, health above mental health for this county for a long time, and now we see the repercussions. So go to David Montiel Parlor, David Montiel, David Montiel, and join a convoy, a peaceful convoy where we can go around with the trucks and not in uh, this protest. Talk to you later. Next speaker is Teresa G. You have two minutes. Please go ahead. Good afternoon. My name is Teresa Galvez. I am a parent advocate with Healthier Kids Foundation. Healthier Kids Foundation has been conducting emotional wellness checks among fifth graders and have found 47% have unmet 
emotional and mental health needs. We recently spoke with a mother about her child's wellness check. She already knew that her daughter needed support. She shared with us that her fifth grader daughter was having suicidal thoughts and ideation. She had no idea where to turn, to, to, to turn, who to talk to, or what to do. Healthier Kids Foundation's phone call about the screening results was this parent's starting point to getting help for her child. If, if it weren't that for this simple screening, who knows when the student would have received support. The truth is, admitting that you need support is hard and scary. We need to make services and as accessible and possible for those who, have brave, who are brave enough to ask for help. And for those who are struggling in silence due to stigma, we need to set a tone that ensures all know, all know mental health is a component of health. Thank you for recognizing how critical mental health services are to our community at this time. Thank you for your time. Next speaker is Amanda Dickey. You have two minutes. Please go ahead. Thank you. Amanda Dickey on behalf of the Santa Clara County Office of Education. I am our executive director of government relations, and I'm just calling in to, to say thank you to the supervisors for their leadership on this item and to express our strong support for the items, um, really all of the items, but really in particular those related to building the early learning and care workforce as well as um, building out the student wellness center approach. Um, I want to reiterate the comments that my colleague made earlier with regards to the efficacy of a school-based approach to student wellness. Children are 10 to 21 times more likely to receive services when they're provided on a school site. I also want to reiterate the comments made by my colleague um, Heidi over at First Life California. We've been working closely with them and they're doing really great work and we're partnering with them to try to address the early learning and care workforce needs, but they are vast and extremely overwhelming. So partnership and um, an additional assistance from the county is greatly needed right now. Thank you. And that concludes our request to speak. Thank you, David, I appreciate that. I believe Supervisor Chavez had some additional comments to make on this item. Thank you, and I really wanted to um, just acknowledge, uh, thank you to all the speakers and all the good work that you all are doing in the community and to Supervisor Allenberg for always putting children and families first. Um, one thing that I would just like to do is in addition to supporting this effort, I'd like to ask the county staff to look at children um, that are 18 to 21. And I'm just mindful, Supervisor Allenberg, that a lot of the work we've been doing with transitional aged youth, we've tried to move that, that um, age up just recognizing that children may be in different um, situations relative to their development. Um, so I, I'd be very interested in that. And then I also just want to say that um, that I recognize that we're really asking about state and federal resources and then whether or not we need to use general fund investments to patch up what we can't get from the state and federal government. So I, I just wanted to really make sure that as we think about this that we're really focused on um, children who've suffered such a great loss. And again, Supervisor Ellenberg, uh, thank you. All righty, roll call vote, please. Oh, Vice President Ellenberg. Thank you. I just, um, I, I agree with, with Supervisor Chavez. And what's really important to note here is that a lot of what we're doing with this referral is continuing and building on work that is already happening in pieces around the county. So new referrals bring in new ideas and perspectives, but very often um, help us as a board to prioritize the work that we are, are looking to get done and lift up and really um, shine a light on opportunities as they arise. And right now there are so many, not only so much need, but so many opportunities for support of this work at the federal and state levels. And um, I just think that I just wanted to echo that um, Supervisor Chavez made a really good point to talk about the funding availability right now that hasn't existed before. Thank you. Thank you. And I certainly hope federal and state funding comes forward too. David, roll call vote, please. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. And President Wasserman. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. And with that, we'll move on to item 13, which is Supervisor Smidians regarding the Lehigh Cement Plant and Quarry. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Let me begin by 
simply moving approval of the recommended action is contained in item 13. And if I can get a second, I'll speak. I'll second that. Thank you for that, uh, Supervisor Lee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, it, the recommended action is um, uh, relatively short and sweet, but nonetheless uh, significant uh, in its impact or potential impact. It is simply to uh, refer to our administration and county council for a report back within 90 days, options for consideration uh, in connection with the potential acquisition of the Lehigh cement plant and quarry property, uh, which is uh, substantially, but not entirely located in our unincorporated county, uh, as well as Cupertino and Palo Alto. Uh, and with that second, let me just say, um, I think colleagues, uh, you all know, but the site is perhaps most familiar to the District 5 supervisor, uh, by virtue of his presence there. I think you all know we have a 3,500 acres uh, quarry and cement plant uh, tucked into the hills uh, right here in the South Bay in the peninsula. And uh, essentially I'm asking what a path might be towards the uh, acquisition of this site, uh, which means the eventual uh, closure of the operation there. And you know, people have asked, well, why now? And uh, as the uh, referral indicates uh, on packet page 40, uh, page two of three in the referral itself, there really are three reasons. Uh, the first is that uh, we have more than a decade now of uh, complaints and violations, and we're in the process of assessing those more uh, formally, but we have a decade of complaints and violations that make it clear that the uh, incompatibility of this operation with the surrounding uses, which are both open space and residential, uh, is getting, uh, is greater and greater with every passing year. Uh, and uh, the, the problem is uh, not abating. If anything, as I say, it's getting more and more challenging with the passage of time. Uh, the second observation is that, and this is perhaps key, we, we know now from the I'll call it the suspended application for a reclamation plan amendment that was submitted by Lehigh in 2019, that there is a significant likelihood uh, based on that suspended application um, that there are plans afoot to uh, expand rather than wrap up operations at this 3,500 acre site in the hills. Um, most members would not have any reason to know that back in 2012, when a prior board on which I think only Mr. Wasserman served, uh, authorized a reclamation plan amendment at that time, the expectation was that there would be a reclamation effort wrapping up around 2032, just 10 years from now. Uh, that date is contained in the reclamation plan amendments, conditions of approval, a 20-year timeline is articulated. Um, but uh, somewhat surprisingly, and I would say uh, it's a source of concern, in 2019, we got an application from Lehigh that indicated a desire to substantially expand operations uh, and, and obviously continue them for the longer term. Uh, and that application has been essentially put on hold. Uh, the uh, folks at Lehigh have said they want to rethink the site and their possible application. I think this is an opportunity we cannot, should not let pass uh, for consideration and deliberation about other uses, what the permanent uh, disposition of the site will be, and how we can look at that in terms of the public interest. Um, it's uh, uh, perhaps not known to most members of the board that Lehigh recently sold all of their Western operations, again, all of their Western operations, except the Lehigh cement plant quarry in our county, uh, because it is a unique case for them, just as it is for us. And so we really do have an opportunity to sit down at the table and say, let's chart a future that ultimately, eventually, on some kind of a timeline, uh, involves the uh, cessation of operations there and public acquisition of the site. And finally, the third point that's noted on packet page 40, page two out of three in the referral is the fact that we know this is doable. Uh, I mean, I think we've always known that intellectually, we've had examples around the country, but just within the last year or so, we've seen the Dumbarton Quarry transformed in a way that's really extraordinary over in the East Bay. Uh, it, it too was once a great big hole in the ground and today, 
uh, it is providing affordable recreation for uh, working class folks, middle class folks here in our Bay Area, uh, camping, hiking, uh, RV parks, um, all, all manner of open space. Um, there's a future here that we can and should chart for the future. Just going to close, Mr. Chair, by saying I have been so pleased and I want to say thank you to the folks who stepped up on the day of our announcement, which was just this past Thursday, so just a few days ago. Uh, we were joined in the uh, announcement by supporters like the mayors of Cupertino and Los Altos and Los Altos Hills. They have subsequently uh, been joined by uh, the mayors of Palo Alto and Sunnyvale. We were joined on Thursday by the Mid Peninsula uh, Regional Open Space District, uh, the local Loma Prieta chapter, the Sierra Club, and the folks at Green Foothills. Uh, they have since been joined in their support by the uh, Mawekma Ohlone Tribe, by uh, the Santa Clara Valley Audubon Society, by Mothers Out Front, Silicon Valley, Greenbelt Alliance, South Bay Clean Creeks Coalition, uh, the California Native Plant Society, and the folks at Grassroots Ecology. Uh, we were joined uh, by our friends in labor, the operating engineers, uh, Local 3, and the Teamsters, uh, Local 853. And um, just this morning, we have a a uh, very strong letter of support from former supervisor, now for State Senator Dave Cortese. So that, along with the literally, I think almost 200 uh, emails and letters of support that have sort of just uh, responded to this notion of let's let's figure it out. Let's not let the years go by and wonder why no one ever said what should the future look like. Um, uh, compels me to say I really do think the time is now, and I look forward to asking for your eye vote. Thank you very much. And doing a little rough math, I think this is my 1,000th referral. And I think three have been turned down. And I am totally in support of this one. And we'll see where it goes. We have two members of the public wishing to speak. Dave, would you please allow them to do so? President Wasserman, how long would you like to give these speakers, sir? Two minutes each. All right, one moment, please. Next speaker is Brian Schmidt. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Uh, good afternoon. Brian Schmidt here from Green Foothills. Uh, we strongly support the proposed referral from Supervisor Simidian. The plan for Lehigh after closure is hillside open space, and it makes sense to consider options for purchase of this land. This referral makes no commitment of resources at this point, as you know, and any actual decision, decision is likely years down the road. So this is a way to start planning intelligently for future options. At last week's press conference, Supervisor Simidian referred to Mid Peninsula Regional Open Space District as likely preferring that the entire quarry and plant be preserved as open space. We want to note that it's not just Mid Pen, but many in the broader environmental community that likely feel this way, but still there's plenty of time to sort this all out. Uh, and finally, I, I want to note the strong parallels between the air pollution at Lehigh and at Reed Hillview Airport. Green Foothills commends the county for working on both issues, and we believe the communities adjacent to both areas are likely to be supportive of both causes. Again, we support uh, this referral, and thank you very much. The next speaker is Brian Malone. You have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Brian Malone, are you there? Good afternoon, Brian Malone, Assistant General Manager, speaking on behalf of the Mid Peninsula Regional Open Space District in support of Supervisor Smidian's referral to county staff to assess the potential acquisition of Lehigh Cement Plant and Quarry. Lehigh Quarry lies next to Rancho San Antonio Open Space Preserve, Rancho San Antonio County Park, and Montebello Open Space Preserve. Rancho is our most beloved preserve and park with over 800,000 visitors annually. These regionally important open spaces, which have been vital to public health during the pandemic, are right next to the quarry and cement plant, which has a long history of environmental degradation, including impacts to air quality, water quality, habitat, and the scenic values that are protected by the 1972 bridge line easement, which MidPen monitors on behalf of the county. We agree with Supervisor Schmidian that now is the time to envision and consider other possibilities, which are both in the public interest and fair to the property owner. MidPen supports reclamation of the site that facilitates wildlife habitat, including corridors between open spaces, the restoration of Permanente Creek, preservation of native plants, improved wildfire resiliency, 
protection of scenic resources, and opportunities for ecologically sensitive public access. While the question of how the site should be best used remains uh, requires further work. What is certain is that the quarry will ultimately be reclaimed and we believe now is the appropriate time to bring together a vision for all stakeholders that supports this outcome sooner rather than later. MidPen hopes to provide our expertise and input to this process as appropriate and thanks the Board of Supervisors for considering this proactive approach. The next speaker is Shawnee. You have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, this is Shani Kleinhaus, Environmental Advocate for Santa Clara Valley Audubon Society, with many other environmental organizations and community organizations. We fully support Supervisor Simiton's referral to direct the county to prepare a roadmap for the acquisition of the Lehigh Cement Plant and Quarry property. Our alert to our membership generated over 130 personal letters, all asking, that the county acquires Lehigh's land and end the company's operation in the midst of our uh, area where people live and play and work. The community is very vocal and very clear. Lehigh has polluted our air, polluted with, with mercury and dust, polluted permanent creek with selenium, bulldozed illegal roads through the hillsides, caused landslides, and expanded into protected areas. Please return that quarry to nature. Please listen to our very, very vocal residents, not only in Cupertino, but throughout the county. It's time to return the land to nature. Thank you. And that concludes our request to speak. Thank you. Supervisor Chavez. Yes, thank you. I, I wanna, say to Supervisor Simidian, thank you for having a big vision here, and this is a big vision. Um, one of the recommendations that I wanted to make to staff um, as you're investigating the, the um, options for purchase and use is that I think there is a value in taking a look at some of the large purchases that have happened and restoration that have happened in our valley in addition to the Dumbarton um, uh, the Dumbarton Quarry, and one of them is the South Bay Salt Pond Restoration Project. And the reason I think that's so critical is that it, one, um, it had a lot of funding sources. Really, I think my recollection is a lot of that was led at a federal level by um, Senator, I think Senator Feinstein, um, but there was a lot of um, support from both the federal and state uh, government, which which made it more possible for local entities to be able to put in their little pieces of resources to get it over the finish line. And then the other I was thinking about was the purchase and preservation of the Redwoods. And I also think uh, Senator Feinstein led on that. Um, but the reason I thought those would be such good um, projects is that they, in particular, the salt salt pond restoration project had both the acquisition of the land, but also the, the, um, the uh, preservation of it and the investment in it. it, you know, and it's pretty dramatic what's happened in a relatively short time when you think about how, how uh, much damage had happened to that tidal pond. Um, so anyway, so that was uh, one recommendation I wanted to make. And then the second was really um, a question, and this may be more of a question for um, Supervisor Simidian. And that is that um, I don't, it's been a while since I read a little bit about what was happening um, at Lehigh relative to Permanente Creek and the, the, um, the water resource there. Um, but I wondered if there are other institutions in the county that have already reached out to you that have an interest in um, the protection of water or the preservation of some part of that land that may also be local partners for investment. Supervisor. Thank you, um, Mr. Chair. Uh, the, Supervisor Chavez, part of the challenge that I think uh, you are um, referring to, I know you're aware of, is the multiplicity of regulatory agencies that, uh, that we hope come together on the site, uh, and literally a dozen or more, depending on how you count. Uh, and there are some, uh, I think, local partners, I'll just let it go at that, who I think might be interested in being part of the solution. I think you hit on it when when you referenced the fact that there are um, probably more than 
one or two funding sources that we would look to cobble together over time. And that's why I wanted to ask the staff to come back in 90 days with the beginnings of a plan uh, to, to think through who might those funding partners be. Some of it could be a local bond measure. Some of it could be state funding. Some of it could be federal funding. Some of it could be some of our open space partners in the uh, Northern California area who have an interest in the acquiring and protecting lands. Um, some of it could even be some modest and appropriate measure of development on the site. That's why there was a little teasing there about uh, all of the site being retained uh. in open spaces. Um, uh, you know, is there the potential for some modest additional increment of housing appropriately placed that would gen then generate revenue. Um, some of it might actually come from Lehigh itself because as you would uh, recall, they have a, um, a financial assurance uh, uh, cost estimate obligation that is in the ballpark, I think of $70 million. At present, it is being uh, reevaluated. Uh, if that was a cost that they did not have to absorb, then that's uh, perhaps a quote contribution that they might be willing to make as a, as a cost avoidance measure. So I think, um, I think really the next step is for our staff to think a little bit about how do we go explore and wrap our arms around something this big and this complicated. Um, and I, I think, you know, clearly it's gonna have to uh, start with some conversation with the folks at Lehigh but I, I think I'd be kidding uh, myself and you if I said I thought I knew who, when, where, and how all that was going to come together at this point, hence, hence the need for a process. I really appreciate it. And, I, and I'll just raise uh, um, two other issues that have been on my, my mind. And one of them, uh, not related to this, but Supervisor Smitty, and the reason I'm raising it is just because I, I, I'm hopeful that by by learning from what the staff learns that it's gonna help us think a little bit about our approach to um, ag land and South County, as well as the Amamutsum uh, 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 properties that we've been talking about in South County as well, because I, I do think that the point you raise is right. These are, these are very complicated. These are over, gonna be over a long period of time. I really appreciate you reminding us about the, um, the required investment already that's going to be required of Lehigh. I think that's a really important point I hadn't thought about, but really better understanding um, how to position uh, ourselves with the public sector and the, um, you know, the philanthropic community to take a look at how to prioritize those things that we most anticipate um, that we're going to be in need of, of purchase. You know, I, I think those are really, really excellent points. And then the other point I would just raise to staff is that Part of the reason I thought the restoration project at the salt ponds was so interesting is because there was a purchase that was required and then an investment that was required in the restoration component as Supervisor Simidian laid out that, that again may be of some assistance in terms of how we think about this and lessons learned for uh, other opportunities relative to South County. Thank you. All right, looks like we have one more hand, Supervisor Lee. Yes, thank you, President Wasserman. Um, First of all, I just really want to say thank you to uh, the hard work that uh, Supervisor Smidian has put into this issue uh, for many, many years. And his most recent uh, referral here to re-envision the new use of this 3,500 acres and old 83-year-old limestone quarry. Uh, as we all know, the open space and residential proposal are all extremely uh, attractive, uh, especially in light of the fact of the history of the pollution in the air and the water and the runoffs. Uh, I don't need to reiterate all those that uh, who live nearby and have understand and work on this issue for so many, many years and decades. Um, the fact that Lehigh has actually sold many of these operations uh, certainly have shown the, the, uh, the reason why it really makes sense for us to re-envision how best to use this. The Dunbarn Quarry is certainly a great uh, potential uh, a model uh, that we could look at and I really would uh, Hope that this would uh, move uh, quickly uh, to come up with these uh, potential solutions uh, to reach a uh, uh, beneficial uh, agreement of how to best use uh, this area. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I'll just close by saying that 3,500 acres is five and a half square miles. And one of your newest cities, Montesorino, is 1.7 square miles. It is three times the size of Montesorino. 
All right, Supervisor Lee, your hand is still raised. I'll be happy to vote, thank you. Okay, David, vote please. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Yes. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. And President Wasserman. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. David, correct me if I misstate, 14 was on consent. We've handled 15 and 16. So we are jumping to number 17. Consider recommendations related to the Valley Homeless Health Care Program. That's what I have in my notes as well. Thank you very much. Just keep me in line. Do we have Mr. There he is, Mr. Paul Lorenz. Hello, uh, President Wasserman, members of the board. Uh, you have our written report and the report asks you to approve a couple items. One is, of course, our quality improvement program. Mm -hmm. It will note that we are going to be focusing on depression going forward. Um, you know, the, the data suggests that we have a lot of room for improvement there. Uh, the other updates include the grant budget, which we are on target to draw down the full amount, as well as the uniform data systems report. And I'll note in that part of the report, in 2021, we served over 6,000 unique individuals through a homeless program with close to 50,000 um, associated visits. Um, that was in light of all the challenges we had around COVID. Um, so our staff are doing an excellent job in reaching out to the community to ensure that they're receiving the services that they need. Uh, the other updates included in your package includes the update on the, uh, the backpack medicine program um, serving Columbus Park. And as uh, Supervisor Cindy Chavez requested, uh, we did provide some additional background on the program and on the staffing. And then of course, we do have uh, a follow-up to Supervisor Ellenberg's request around the services provided by Parisi House and how we can better, better utilize those services. You did receive a supplemental report from uh, the Behavioral Health Department. I think it's important to say that we will be working closely with the Behavioral Health Department in the Gateway Program to ensure that we can further facilitate uh, the referral process, but also the utilization of those very important services to our women um, that need that support in our community. And with that being said, uh, I'm more than happy to respond to specific questions that you may have. Thank you, SCVMC CEO Paul Lorenz. We'll turn to Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. Um, I, so first of all, I, I really want to thank um, Celine and Paul and the team for adding services to Columbus Park, especially during uh, these past several weeks when it's been colder than usual. So I had the opportunity to meet with some of the physicians and residents last week. I was totally impressed with how intense and focused they are on really providing services to those who are uh, very high need. And, um, and this is one part of an, the um, work here, I think is an example of what I'm hoping we're gonna be able to talk about at the workshop on the 28th, because this is so operational and so really down to the, down to brass tacks. Um, and so just a couple of questions that I, I wanna make sure that we're able to respond to on the 28th, unless someone has a response today. And that is, do we have enough detox beds and residential beds? And are there um, sufficient beds for specific subpopulations? And second, um, is the access to the system, have we created access to <laughs> systems that are working against our goals uh, to help get people into the right treatment bed when they express a desire to do so? Like, are we able to do it quickly? Are we making it really simple? And by the way, what do we mean is immediate by versus what does a client mean by immediate uh, access? And then third, what systems and processes can we change now to increase the access to capacity we have while we increase capacity in the system? And again, if you want to respond to those questions now, or if you'd prefer to wait till the 28th, I, I'm fine either way. Uh, thank you, Supervisor. I know Bruce Copley is with us today. Um, I, I know that we can clearly provide a written summary and be prepared at the, the upcoming forum. Um, Bruce, did you want to wait or did you want to respond now uh, through the chair? Bruce. I think uh, we're uh, working on that for the 28th. So, um, you could wait until the 28th, that would be best for us to give you accurate information. 
Would that be all right, Supervisor Chavez? Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Vice President Ellenberg. Thank you. And Paul, thank you really for, for the, the great report. I appreciate your commitment to continuous improvement, but there's really a lot of a lot of work going on right now, a lot of good work going on right now. Uh, I appreciate the follow-up on the issues around the Parisi House utilization and referrals. Thank you for that. Um, I'm concerned about the about challenges that were cited for patients having to call in repeatedly to Gateway to access a slot. Um, Certainly this is an issue for pregnant patients that could be uh, served al almost immediately at Parisi, but it's really a concern for all clients who are ready to access the substance use disorder treatment. And as with kind of with, with so much of our behavioral health system, it's difficult to discern if the lack of access is a result of insufficient capacity for services, barriers built into our processes or some combination of, of both. And that, that comment is also relevant to the mental health navigation and call center items uh, that we'll be talking about under item 20. I did see the, um, the memo that, be, that behavioral health um, also provided on the general mechanisms for access. And while their memo outlines how the system is planned to work with the two-stage intake and then placement, I've heard from a number of sources uh, stories of people told to call back multiple times a day for a detox bed or several days in a row for a residential treatment bed. Um, certainly, it's it's understandably a, a frustrating process for people who are trying to access care. Can can you either Paul or Bruce? And again, if this is not a today question, um, it can be included in the in the on the twenty eighth. But I'm hoping you can clarify the treatment access process that's referenced. In the memo, the memo provides no. The memo um, notes a high rate of no shows between referral and, and actual admission. So, if uh, if someone at, gets a referral, are they connected immediately to the placement coordinator, or does that person need to call back to complete the next step? Um, so, this is Bruce Copley, director Thanks, of Bruce. access yeah. and, and services through President Wasserman. Yes. The, <laughs> There are two elements. One, one, one is Gateway does the screening and referral. That's an eight to ten minute screening that um, looks at the American Addiction Society level of care, which is what we're required to do, which dictates either de social detox, residential, or outpatient programming. Uh -huh. the, the callback has to do with detox, and we we've, we've done several alleged files talking about the need for additional detox beds. For residential, once they are identified as referring to residential, it goes to the care coordinator that coordinates them getting to service. There isn't an additional screening done. That screening that is done at the call center sets that individual for residential. Then it's a question of what does it take to get that person to Prezi House, uh, Mariposa for women, or Pathway House for men. Uh, and, and, and Bruce, who, yeah. at, with that second step, Whose responsibility is it? Is it the potential client or patient's responsibility to connect to that that next person, or does that next person reach out to the client? And what what happens if the client doesn't have regular phone access? Well, that's a problem. It, it's really the quality mm. improvement care coordinator should be reaching out to the the uh, prospective client, mm -hmm. uh, identifying what it takes for that individual to go to residential and either using case management or uh, a taxi service or coordinating with the Department of Corrections if they're coming out of the jail to get them actually to the site so that they can be intaked. Mm -hmm. um, I definitely, uh, what Mr. Lorenz talked about, I, we do need to circle back and look at some of the barriers that are happening with the Valley uh, uh, Homeless Project. We right. have set a back channel phone uh, number for the nurses to be able to call directly and coordinate services. Um, it's definitely obviously not working as it is, and I'd like to be able to work with his staff to expedite that process. There are open beds at Parisi House, so it is not a question of not enough beds at Parisi House. We do have a backlog with detox beds, and the the, the, the challenge we have is you're never quite sure when someone is going to be discharged out of detox. It could be three days 
or five days. So mm -hmm. if they have a wait list and not have that person call back, what, what has happened in the past is they, they don't show up and we have a bed that sits there. So the bottom line is we need more detox beds so that we have a throughput that eliminates the need for that callback and allows people to get immediately into detox. Um, right. And the other issue is that some of these clients um, really don't need detox before they go into residential. It depends on the severity of their addiction and whether or not they need that detox services so they can then go into residential and begin the rehab side of that uh, of the services. Um, Gateway gets 35,000 calls a year. So it's a, it's a very um, high turnaround process. Um, but definitely, I, I mean, what is raised here needs to be looked at. And I, I'm really looking forward to meeting with Paul's staff and coming up with some solutions that can expedite getting individuals uh, into their appropriate level of care. Wonderful. Thanks so much for that, that answer. And I'm particularly interested in, in solutions that might be under consideration by BHHP and behavioral health to improve access for unhoused patients to substance abuse treatment. If I can refer again, just to item 20, there's a reference there to setting up direct phone access for emergency departments to make direct referrals to behavioral health urgent care. And I'm wondering if a similar system could be set up for um, VHHP providers to have a direct line for um, substance use treatment placement. Supervisor, those are all really good uh, suggestions and I, I really look forward to digging into those and coming up with some solutions. Fantastic, let me just make one more um, comment in closing. I really truly am looking forward to the, the session on the 28th. Um, I would like to ask VHHP and the behavioral health staff to continue working on these solutions to streamline access to treatment for patients uh, and provide a progress report please in the March uh, VHHP report. And additionally, I'd like um, some information on substance use disorder treatment capacity for withdrawal management and residential care, as well as um, kind of more of a detailed outline on procedures for accessing care uh, as part of the work session on the 28th. Does that work? Is that something already in line with the direction you're going? He says thumbs up. Okay. All right, Paul and Bruce, both, thank you both very much. Thank you. Vice, Vice President Ellenbrook, since you liked everything so much, would you like to make the motion for the four items? I would be delighted to. The motion is to accept the reports with the additional direction uh, given by myself and Supervisor Chavez. Second. Yes, so we've got a motion and a second. We have no members of the public. Please go ahead and call a roll. Whoop. Supervisor Lee. Yes, I just want to say thank you to uh, both Supervisor Chavez and uh, Supervisor Ellenberg for those comments, and they actually covered those questions I was going to ask. Uh, and the concerns I have regarding the uh, gateway referral systems, the the access and the lack of access uh, to individuals waiting, you know, hours or whatnot. Uh, so I'm glad that that's happening. We, uh, my team, uh, have been able to go out to with the backpack team uh, about three weeks ago to actually be on the ground to see what happens over there, and certainly been extremely uh, educational and get to understand the really God's work that these folks the doctors and the nurses and the team that's out there doing every day. So I really want to commend uh, the backpack team and, and the VHP uh, program for what is helping out those most vulnerable in our community. Uh, and I really do think this is a, a great uh, uh, movement moving ahead to make sure that this is this is going to work uh, uh, to improve. And now, again, the doubling the of the capacity increasing the backpack team is certainly important. And I certainly hope that uh, these type of service could increase. As far as the issue with the backtracking, I believe FGOC a meeting, we had it uh, referral out already. And I think uh, uh, Dr. Smith mentioned February 28th is our special meeting uh, relating mental health. And I really look forward to hearing those report back because uh, I really do believe that we have a very huge shortage of uh, uh, treatment beds uh, and, and, uh, and uh, let's get those numbers together and see how we could improve those metrics and uh, look at potential increase, significant increase of the beds available for our county. Thank you. Thank you. We have a motion. We have a second. We have no public speakers. David, your turn. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. I believe we've uh, lost Supervisor Simidian momentarily. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. President Wasserman. 
I say yes as well. We'll go back um, one more time for Supervisor Simidian. It looks like he may have left the meeting room momentarily. Yeah, he's got some technical problems. Shutting down, restarting, he'll be right back. So let's take that. Let's take that as four eyes. Understood. Thank you. Thank you. And CEO Lorenz, don't go anywhere because we now move on to not only 18, which is you, and 19, which is you. Vice President Ellenberg also pulled 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, and 40 to go along with us. Vice President Ellenberg. Vice President Wasserman, to, to be clear, um, I don't intend to ask questions about each of those items that I pulled. I just did not want them to be voted on outside of the, the context of this conversation. Okay, would you like to start the conversation right now or hear from CEO Lorenz if he has any comments to make? Um, Paul, is there, are there comments that you want to make first? I'm happy to just go right to my questions if you'd like. Thank you, Supervisor. Um, and uh, President, I'm, I'm more than happy to move right to questions. Okay, let's try that and see how it works. Go right ahead. All right. All right. Thank you so much. And, and, and thank you for bringing these items forward, uh, especially in the context of the discussions about the mid-year budget. I thought it would be helpful to um, have uh, myself and my colleagues understand that proposed expansion as a whole and really be clear about um, the areas of growth and the expectations about revenues. Can you tell me just first um, about the decision to bring these changes now rather than as part of the annual budget process when the board would normally consider expansion of programs in addition of new positions? Thank you, Supervisor. So um, for the past year, if not longer, given the COVID situation, we've been looking at the demand for our services. And what we've outlined in terms of our report and uh, conveyed relative to the data is that we've seen a significant and sustained need for services within the healthcare system. And this is beyond what we've experienced due to COVID. Um, and so it was very important from our perspective to begin to stabilize the workforce and align the staffing based on the need. Um, and as, as you well know, the challenges in terms of filling uh, these critical positions in staffing takes time. And so we felt it was important that we get before the board as quickly as possible. In my conversations with the county executive, Dr. Smith, um, obviously he, he agreed given the stress that the system has been under for the past two years. Mm -hmm. um, and from a revenue standpoint, what we see is because we have that sustained need and, and volume of, of pent up demand for our services, um, if we're able to get these clients and patients into our system, the revenue will follow. Um, and so if you notice that most of our proposals outline where we stand relative to volume in the preceding six months to pre-pandemic numbers, mm -hmm. and you can see that in many situations, the cancer program, renal care, um, hospital patient days as we adjust it with St. Louis and O'Connor, and in some service areas at Valley, um, you're seeing that sustained level of need and service requirements. Mm -hmm. and so we felt that uh, not only do we have good revenue projections in terms of what the need is and the volume is, anticipated volume is going to be, uh, but we really, really want to stabilize the workforce. Um, and that's going to take time given the pressures we're under um, within the healthcare industry in general. Thank you. That's that's helpful in understanding the the timing and why you're a little bit ahead of the ahead of the curve um, on the on the mid year budget. I noted that some of the the rationales submitted, uh, particularly uh, with regard to uh, item 18, indicate positions that are being added to replace some that were lost due to the VSIP last year. And I believe there was also a round of VMC additions after that action to replace critical positions. And I think uh, behavioral health as well had a small addition. Are other departments also being asked to revisit their VSIP impacts? That might be more for Dr. Smith. Um, that's more for me. Um, I would say that uh, <clears throat> we're not formally asking them to revisit that. However, um, we are receiving departmental recommendations for next year's budget, we're looking at those carefully. I'm sure that some of them will um, involve 
on losses of services related to VSIP, but uh, we're not specifically asking for that. And we're also asking the departments to be very prudent and cautious after what uh, we talked about last Tuesday. Um, unless there's a particular need and a particular possibility of an external revenue source, which is why we were willing to put the VMC uh, issues on the tape positions and modif appropriation modification on the table today because there is the opportunity for outside revenue. Yeah, let me ask you a little bit more about that. Thank you. Between today's items and those approved on January 25th, we're looking at about 94 million in expenditures and 487 positions backed by a projected 88 million uh, in new revenue. How confident are you in those revenue projections and in our ability to meet those, especially given really the ups and downs of the of healthcare utilization over the last two years, uh, including due to COVID? Well, I'm reasonably confident. Um, however, you know, there's quite a number of caveats. Um, as you brought up before, CalAIM is the caveat, uh, behavioral health is a caveat. Um, we have problems. Potentially Kaiser. Kaiser oh, is a caveat. Mm -hmm. um, there is an, other reasons for bringing um, last month um, the package to the board because we've had a long usage of registry and other um, contract services. And we felt, you know, we really just cannot continue with that. It's much better to have employees um, fill those spots, particularly the nursing spots. It causes a lot more consistency um, in care and fewer mistakes um, if they're employees rather than contract nurses. However, you know, as you well bring up, um, we're always projecting revenue based on what our <clears throat> recent past experience is. And particularly with COVID, things can change rapidly. So we've put uh, Paul's uh, thumbs in the screws and told him he's got to come up with the money. <laughs> No pressure. Um, let me just be clear also that I, I absolutely support the effort to expand services in critical areas to provide relief to staff that has been stretched beyond thin and to reduce our, our reliance on, on contract staff and extra help. I just wanna make sure that as we continue to talk about the budget, we balance support of VMC with support to other parts of our health system, particularly behavioral health and public health. For sure, services inside the walls of our hospitals are critical, but so are community-based health promotion efforts. I recognize that those don't necessarily generate revenue in the way that VMC does, but they're often preventative upstream interventions that, that can keep our residents healthy and prevent much more costly care down the road. Um, and with that in mind, I noted that in item 21, uh, 39, on the dental services expansion, references were made to unmet dental needs higher now since the onset of the pandemic for both adults and kids, and that revenue projections exceed expenditures in that area. Given the data that we've been seeing in schools on unmet dental needs, um, I'd like to add, and I'll, I'll make a referral to accept the, the report and all of the consent items, uh, make a motion, not a referral, a motion. I'd like administration to revisit our contracts for school-based health screenings, including dental screenings, and identify opportunities to enhance those contracts to ensure that screenings and case management take place to connect kids to the clinical care uh, that we are expanding. And I'd like uh, the board to get an update on that uh, work in an off agenda a report by the end of March, please. I'll second. Thank you very much. And Vice President Ellenberg, just for clarification, your motion was for 18 and 19 plus 33 through 40? Yes. That would be all 10 items. All 10 items. Thank you. And Supervisor Lee, your second was for all 10 of those items? Yes, as well. Thank you. Um, I'll come back to my question of Dr. Smith in just a minute. Supervisor Lee. 
Yes, that was just a quick uh, follow-up question with uh, Ms. Lawrence. Hi, Paul. Um, the uh, SDU step-down um, unit uh, for the search, uh, the <clears throat> idea of it is that would increase the capacity to provide these uh, specialty care without necessarily pushing uh, patients into the ICU realm. Uh, and that, that way, with these being established, you do believe that there will be basically freeing up uh, multiple ICU beds as well, correct? Thank you, Supervisor Lee, for that question. So the answer is it will free up additional beds for our critically ill patients. Uh, what we do typically is the surgical ICU will have the patients admitted after surgery, and then this will allow us to step in those patients to a, to a level of care that's commensurate with the care and standard of care that they need and allow for the more critical staff beds um, and needs to be addressed within the system. So it does increase their capacity as a hospital. Right, and then of course, the, the cost to operate these step-down beds will be less than the cost to operate the ICU beds, right? Since it's- That is correct. Exactly, so in, in some words, waste is potentially could be uh, uh, fund savings, but yet at the same time, providing better service as well. Yes, sir. Great. Thank you, that's all I have. Thank you. We have no members of the public wishing to speak on these 10 items. Dr. Smith, I have a quick question for you. I'm putting you on the spot a little bit, but I know a lot of times we deal with our involvement with the schools, and I understand and totally respect the passion Vice President Ellenberg has. Um, what is your understanding, Dr. Smith, as far as the county's roles and the school's ro roles in instances such, such as some of these issues? Were the counties providing services um, for the school-age children? Well, um, good question and a tough policy call, I think, for the board and for a lot of people. Um, in theory, the schools are the responsibility of the state. However, they're chronically underfunded in many different ways and over um, re overly restricted. So um, I think the county has to step in in a number of areas, uh, particularly developmental disability, children's services, um, after school issues, childcare. Um, it could go on, the list is pretty large. Um, no, I, I understand the, that. I schools, schools get funding really only based on kids well, not only, but primarily based on kids showing up and being in chairs. And, you know, we know that that's not necessarily a great measure of how much work needs to be done or what kind of work needs to be done. Preventative care, uh, preventative services, mental health services, family services, um, all um, do not they're not reflected by how many kids are in chairs. So it's really hard for schools and school boards to make those adjustments. And I think uh, we have some supervisors who have been school board members who can testify to that. Uh, sure. Thank you, I, I appreciate that. I just see and read about the last few years, the $10 billion surplus, whatever billion dollar surplus it is. And, if any members in this in Sacramento are listening, I'd sure like you to divert some of that money to your schools. And then we can talk courts after that. All right, thank you very much. Um, we've got a motion, we have a second, no members of the public, roll call vote please, Dave. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. And President Wasserman. Yes, and thank for you. the record, that was I votes on 18 and 19 and 33 through 40 motions by Ellenberg and Lee. Thank you. We now move on to item number 20. Let me just flip my binder pages over. We should have Sherry. I saw, I see Moretta, I see Michaela. And I think who's gonna lead this off? Um, good afternoon, President Wasserman and Board of Supervisors. I'll lead us off. Loretta, yes, please. <laughs> we have Mikkel Lee, who's the Division Director for the Consumer Affairs, Family Affairs, and Cultural Communities Wellness Program. 
uh, as well as a lead for this mental health systems uh, navigator program. And we also have Michelle De La Calle, who's the director of the Office of System Integration and Transformation with the Health and Hospital Systems, who will uh, guide us through a, a brief PowerPoint on the navigation system referral. And we All have right. one of our staff that will pull up the PowerPoint for us. And I see Zelia and Margaret. Welcome. We'll start the presentation. Thank you, supervisors. For Can you talk a little the, louder, please? Sure, I'll turn on my camera. There you go. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Thank okay, you. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, thank you for the opportunity to present on the Mental Health System Navigator Program uh, for our presentation today. Um, we'll be talking about um, the concept and vision of the navigation program and feedback from our stakeholders meetings, as well as estimated strategic plan. Um, next slide, please. Next. Sure. Um, the concept of the Navigator program is to provide uh, individuals, families, and community members the best experience when assessing services, uh, seeking support services in behavioral health, health, and uh, community resources and services. The idea is to provide personalized services to connect with the callers guide and link them to resources and services that best fit their needs. And uh, taking the feedback from our community members as well as our at our stakeholders uh, meeting, we heard that, you know, individuals and community members, family members had to call our access line and were asked to call back or when they had referrals that uh, they were, uh, that was sent, but they were not linked couldn't get an appointment, et cetera. Uh, so the goal is um, the navigator would listen to the needs and the concern, provide support, collaborate with community partners and ensure linkage to services um, to resolve access, um, to resolve barriers to access. Um, and that means that the, the um, navigator would then uh, provide not only just resource type of services, but also look into new referrals, return referrals, uh, how to ensure linkage to services, meaning either a doctor appointment um, or a meds eval appointment or support in, 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 level, uh, in change in level of care, as well as uh, responding and supporting in any type of inquiries, including uh, EPS, inpatient or crisis type of services. Next. Um, the vision of um, the navigation program is to have a person-centered service approach um, that eliminates barriers of timely access to provide timely access to ensure linkage to the right services at the right time. And it is necessary to have seamless coordinated services across system to provide collaboration care with primary health and other community partners. Um, at this time, I will pause and I will pass it on to Michelle to share the feedback collected from our uh, stakeholder meetings. Michelle. Hi. Thank you. Good afternoon, supervisors. Thank you, Mikkel and Moretta, for uh, uh, inviting me to participate in the stakeholder engagement process. Um, I worked in collaboration with the Behavioral Health Services uh, Department to collect this information and, and work with the, um, the community um, to, to get input. Um, one of the first questions, and I'll, I'll go through the questions and summarize some of the information we got back. So next slide, please. So um, this is just a small subset of the questions. And, and what I want to say first is um, there was so much passion, so much energy brought to these meetings. Um, definitely um, uh, really important to get this information. And we did get, I think, a lot of really good information to help support the Behavioral Health Department in determining the best road forward here. Um, these are some of those things, but that one-stop shop, 24-7, some approach where one person can serve somebody through the through their level of care um, and provide uh, support and encourage engagement, something that's easy to access. So these are some of the concepts that they said, this is what a navigator program should look like. Next slide. 
Oh, next slide. Oh, how would it, how would we access it? Sorry, back one. How would we access it? One phone number, again, that availability, we would need to do marketing, make sure that we had a, a drop-in centers, um, uh, something available on social media through a mobile app, uh, something that you could monitor or, or uh, navigate through on your own on your own via uh, computer or website. It should be easy and simple, not complicated. It should be um, able to be accessed by a number of people um, in any different situation. There should be immediate access to transportation and um, language if needed. Um, and those are some of the things of how it would be accessed. Next slide. So what would a navigator, how would we know that, that we have the right people to be a navigator? They need to be able to communicate. They need to have excellent customer service skills. They have to be resourceful and know the information that might be available. Preferred to have lived, lived experience, which can help people understand um, how to process and manage the system. And then multilingual, culturally competent, compassionate, empathy, patience, all of these things would be an amazing to have in this in this person to be able to help people navigate this com complex system and get to the right place. Next slide. And how, if we did the service right, would it improve the behavioral health system in general? It would allow this continuity, this ability to get people through the system with ease. It would decrease hospitalizations, potentially decrease incarceration. It would save lives. It could get somebody to the right service the first time instead of having to figure it out on their own or maybe end up in the wrong service and need to go back through. It builds trust in the community. It builds trust in the services that we do provide. And it improves the whole person and the integration across the systems. Next slide. In addition to the in-person or the Zoom meetings with the, with the community, we offered an opportunity to give online um, uh, survey responses in addition. So we gave people the night to think on it. And the next day we sent out the questions again and asked for any additional information or concepts that they didn't feel uh, that came up to them through the night or that they wanted to give us additional information on. Um, again, accessibility, access, um, ease of entry into the system. Um, there's a lot of, there was a lot of questions and some parking lot issues about pay, who's, pay, who's the payer? How do we um, help the community at large? Who are we helping? How do we affect where they end up um, going into the system? Also a lot of questions about role clarity. Who's doing what and for whom and what time? And then also some um, information or clarity around documentation and the data collection components. So really understanding how do we get to clear actionable data that can help us affect the process of navigation in this complex and complicated system. So on that note, I'll give it back to Mikkel and it was just a real honor to work with the community. Thank you, Michelle. Um, next slide, please. So for the estimated strategic timeline, um, the first two and a half months, uh, we have been uh, part of the, uh, you know, the kind of discovery phase in the strategic planning process. Uh, from December to present, we have held two convenings, uh, one in December, one in January. Um, we have looked at three navigator programs around the state to learn about their model and best practices. Um, we also conduct environmental uh, a, uh, an environmental scan of the navigator type of programs within the Santa Clara County um, to look at um, existing services and the possibility of streamlining services and resources. Um, the third convening will be held in February 17th to propose a design for discussion that reflects the ideas of the community um, uh, and obtain feedback. Um, uh, within behavioral health, we have the Office of Consumer Affairs, Family Affairs, and Cultural Wellness, uh, Cultural Community Wellness Program, uh, where we have uh, behavioral health peer support workers, very peer focused, as well as staff with 
people with lived experience. Um, these are existing staff and resources that we can tap into uh, to launch our initial phase of the Navigator program. We are also uh, looking at um, drop-in centers for the Navigator program, i.e. Um, drop-in centers within uh, urgent care as well as Zephyr self-help self centers. And the services will be parallel to our uh, telephone access services. Um, up four positions are being requested through MHSA. Uh, but again, with the uh, pending those four positions, we. Uh, we, we are tapping in our existing staff resources, i.e. vacant codes that, are, that we are currently recruiting, uh, actively recruiting uh, to launch the program. Uh, in March, we will complete data collection and analysis, um, propose a model to, and then develop an, implement, an implementation plans that, includes, uh, that include a phase approach and continue to hold community convenings. Uh, from April, to June, um, we're looking at identifying initial staff and provide training, develop a measurement uh, system that access impact, like how do we know if this is working, how do we know uh, if, uh, how is success being defined, right? And then in July, 2020, we're hoping to launch phase one, um, which is our telephone access services and uh, possibly starting with two walk-in centers, which is Zephyr and Mental Health Urgent Care. Next. Actually, um, that concludes our you. presentation on the navigation program. Thank you very much. And I wanna thank you for sending us the 11 page PowerPoint in enough time for us to read it thoroughly before this meeting. We don't always get the PowerPoints as far ahead as I would like. So rest assured that we all read every single page of this. We have no members of the public wishing to speak on this item and it's a received report only. There is no vote, supervisor submitting. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the staff for uh, both pulling together this uh, information for us, but also for the work that uh, has been uh, performed on a timely basis following uh, the referral. Let me just ask a couple of quick questions, if I may. Uh, one is, did I hear correctly that this will come back to the board in March? Who's... We don't have it scheduled, but uh, we could potentially come back um, to, in March to provide an update. That's not currently scheduled. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Well, I, I am... I'm just anxious that we keep this on track. Um, I, let me take a quick look and see when our um, uh, uh, our next um, health and hospital committee meetings are scheduled for. Um, I think we have one on Wednesday, March 16th. Um, would it be possible for you to report back then on further progress at the committee level? Yes, that would be possible. All right. Well, I will move approval, Mr. Chair, uh, uh, if you want a motion to receive the report, but I guess if it's going to have direction, which it, we probably should then have a motion, uh, right. move approval so that we receive the report, direct staff to report uh, on progress at the March uh, 16th HHC meeting. And my my goal in asking for that report back is um, I just want to make sure that we really do stay on track for uh, a July launch. And as if I get a second, I will have just a couple more questions before I let go. Supervisor Chavez. So thank you for the second supervisors and I uh, I see my colleagues queuing up here. So let me ask, I heard the two walk-in centers. Could you, but I, it was just very faint at my end. Could you tell us again where you anticipate the two walk-in centers, drop-in oh. centers? Uh, thank you, Supervisor, for the question. Um, the, uh, for the initial phase, we are looking at uh, Zephyr Self-Help Center and Mental Health Urgent Care as the two drop-in centers. 
And uh, those are both in what city or town? Um, San Jose. Uh, and so now I'm going to ask you, what about those other 14 cities and towns? Uh, Supervisor Wasserman, I could see smiling because he, he knew I was coming. So uh, where, what about those other 14 cities and towns? Uh, for uh, the uh, second phase, we're looking at um, South County, i.e. Um, uh, at the Esperanza Self-Help Center in Morgan Hill, as well as North County in Sunnyvale Clinic, um, and also at the um, uh, Youth Drop-In Center. Uh, we are looking at possibly three uh, added to um, our second phase is drop-in centers. All right. Well, it, thank you. I'll I'll, uh, I'll give you a heads up right now. I'll probably have more questions about that on the 16th of March. So I don't don't want that to be a surprise. Uh, let me also ask if um, uh, if we're anticipating uh, the ability. To, uh, there was passing reference to the question about who gets served, and what about folks who are fortunate enough to have private insurance. Can we help demystify uh, the process for them and uh, provide them with some guidance about how to navigate the system, even if they do have private insurance? Um, currently, we, I, I believe we are receiving those call at the uh, call center. And I think we can, uh, uh, with the navigating uh, program, I think we can improve upon those services and provide additional guidance uh, to assist our callers who have private insurance come in, i.e. accessing community resources um, or um, uh, guide, giving them guidance in terms of how to access to their uh, health uh, services. All right, let me just indicate that that will be one that I will very much be pursuing at the March 16th meeting. So I want to give you a heads up on that one as well. And um, last question uh, for today before I turn to Dr. Smith is um, it, it, you're talking about, I think, four positions. Is, is it your expectation that this would be county staff or would some aspects of this navigator program be contracted out to uh, one or more of our nonprofit partners? Is there any thinking that you can share today about that? I'll answer that and then uh, Marata, if you uh, might want to tap in, uh, but um, we're uh, with the four positions, we're looking at county staff, one program manager, two, three mental health peer support workers, as well as we uh, do have vacant codes that we're actively recruiting and we're hoping to tap in those staffing resources to um, for this uh, for the initial launching of this uh, program. Thank you. And let me uh, through the chair, if I may pivot to Dr. Smith and say, Dr. Smith, if we're talking about a July programmatic launch, that of course anticipates uh, the four staff that uh, have just been referenced. And that of course uh, would require some action as part of our June budget. Are, are you and your budget staff uh, teeing this one up so that it will be uh, before our board for consideration as part of our regular budget process? Dr. Yes. Okay, that, that's when Mike Wasserman tells me to take yes for an answer, because that's what I'm always uh, saying. And uh, uh, I will say thank you for that. And um, I'll turn to my colleagues who I see have their hands up as well. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. Um, let, let me kind of zoom out for just a minute and say to the staff, I'm really excited about um, the, this direction in general. So thank you for that. The two, two areas I'm really wanting to better understand is um, how, how this gets designed in a way that is really truly responsive to the community, meaning that um, you know people aren't waiting for an extended period of time or the phone's just not ringing or they, you know, they, they kind of get hung up on. And so my, my question is, have you all taken a look at the CAN Center, our child advocacy um, hotline? So let me just remind all of you that um, some years ago that had a 50 or 60% answer, um, you know, the calls were getting answered and a bunch of calls weren't and they were going into voicemail. 
And what we did was we took a good look at their staffing and also the technical support that they had, you know, like the kind of computers and access they had. And I'm sure, Joe, uh, you can remember this, that when we when I went in to go see this facility, they were still using a whiteboard to um, assign children to getting um, a social worker and they no longer are using a whiteboard. It's a very different place now. And now the calls being picked up are in the 96 percentile um, rate. And some of that was done through um, looking at shift change, you know, like restructuring the way the response happens. So what I would like to ask is prior to you all getting a chance to go back to Supervisor Simidian, in um, mid-March that you all get a tour of the CAN Center and take a look at and the transformation of where they were and what changes they made. Um, and then the other recommendation I would make is that at that time, we recommended to them that they look at the other call centers in the county to better understand um, how they were streamlining work and you know really to better understand it from a process perspective, including even our county's 911 system. So, I, I would just recommend that that or request that that happen. I, I thought it was, um, I think we one of the things we forget is how big the county is, as we were reminded by uh, President Wasserman this morning and how many resources we have in our own family to go look and say, how did you all do it? So that would be one um, recommendation. Um, the second is that I, I am very concerned that every time we start a new program, we get a new email address and a new um, a new phone number. And I, I think we are asking, you know, I just was at one of our, um, picked up one of our um, um, forms. It's an, eight, it's an 11 and a half by 18 with all the phone numbers you can get for behavioral health. That is too many. And it requires people to dive in and make determinations that, that they may or may not know. Is it an emergency? Is it non emergency? Is it a drug problem or really a behavioral health problem? It's just way too bananas. And even in the presentation we just got, it's got a lot of phone numbers. And um, colleagues, I'll just share with you um, a concern that I have, which is that whether it's the, the MCAT or the emergency care for children, you know, the, the I, it's too much. And I am concerned that even as we come up with new programs where we are trying to use a non-emergency number, I'm just gonna say my preference here, a non-emergency number, like not using 911 or 311 or 988, the new number you're talking about, that I think that we are asking the public to make determinations that they need assistance making, at least for some period of time. And I'm concerned about how we track the effective response if we're not able to um, really align all of those those um, inputs in one framework. I'm, I'm even nervous about that as it relates to the nonprofit response for behavioral health versus police response. I just think we have to be thinking long term about how we study the whether or not we're sending the right team, how that information is gathered, who's around the table to take a look at it and um, and the like. So I there may be differences of opinion among my colleagues on that, but what I'm sharing is it's too complicated. It just is, it's too complicated. So um, one of the things that I hope we, we take a look at with our outreach is that we are talking to folks who are actually using the numbers, you know, really dialing those numbers and helping us understand um, how, be how best to do that, what numbers would be most helpful for them and the process by which we're, um, we're, we're um, determining where people go, you know, how people get moved to different places. I recognize that there are some that make more sense to be separate. I think people looking for the suicide a crisis line, you know, that number has been out for a while, but in any case, you all understand the point that I, I feel like I read everything you write and I can't advise people what to call. I'm calling you all because I can't get through it. Okay. Um, yeah, oh. I'm sorry. Um, sure. and then, yeah, I do. I'm please, sorry. This is something please. I've been very concerned about. Um, for the study session, what what recognizing that this is a work in pro progress, I really uh, I get that. Um, but for the study session and to Supervisor Simidian's point, I really think there's some 
it, once you've all designed and decided what you want the outcomes to be, I think really being able to tell us what's the work plan to get to those benchmarks would be really helpful so that we can um, address community concerns, but also what should our expectation be of the, of the call-in center and even the walk-in centers? How long should someone have to wait till they get connected? And then the other thing is adding one, more people like navigators and advocates. Like, I just want to say this out loud to all of you that I'm nervous about us assigning people to help people get through a process that we've designed that is too complicated for them to use instead of being out, able to add more people to provide the services. And so we've got to, we've got to think about that from a process. I know you all are thinking about it. I'm just saying out loud what, what makes me crazy is when I see, oh, we're going to have more navigators or more advocates to get into line for for services we don't have, which is again, why I would want one call center so we can say, how long is somebody waiting? Like how, how long is somebody waiting? And what do we think is an acceptable wait time versus what the clients think is an acceptable wait time? I kind of raised that earlier, but, but anyway, so thank you for hearing all that. On the 28th, I'll look forward to hearing more. Love that you're gonna go report out to um, Supervisor Simidian. I wanna say out loud, I recognize this is really hard because for the child, um, for the CAN Center, even though they were only receiving, they have one type of call, it's very complex. And you know who gets sent to what, I recognize, but please talk to them because they got through it and they're doing really well now. Thank you. Thank you, a lot of head nodding there, I see they're gonna follow the guidance. So we have a motion, we have a second. We have additional questions from Vice President Ellenberg. Thank you. I, I, I'm really excited as well about this work, and I love that we are looking at this holistically. And what I'm hoping will come forward on the 28th is that we'll look at all of these programs and, and services and supports and numbers and navigators together um, for two purposes. One, so that we're shifting our thinking from looking for another, you know, to add another tool to our toolbox to really um, redesigning a system and then thinking about the fact that we need navigators and so many other supports because it is so complex. Are there things that we can be thinking about across programs and, and really echoing a lot of what Supervisor Chavez said to really do meaningful systems change? I, I think it should be clear to all of you in behavioral health that you have the full support and backing and enthusiasm of the Board of Supervisors. We want to support you in this work. I'm certain we all want to get to, to the same place. So please think big, dream big. Don't focus on individual tools as much as what do you need? What do we need to create a full coherent system? And then we'll figure out together how to get there. Thank you. I heard. I could see Dr. Smith hearing you say, go big. <laughs> All right. We have additional questions. Supervisor Smithian. No, it's just a comment. And uh, it's not that I disagree with my colleagues, but I want to be very clear about why I introduced this as a referral. While you're thinking big and dreaming big, we got to make the system work right now for people who need help right now in a system that is unbelievably complicated and daunting and fraught. So it, it's not that I don't share their sense of, passion and enthusiasm for a bigger picture solution or set of solutions. But I just, uh, I don't think we can wait while we reinvent the system. Uh, and until that day comes, uh, people should be able to access someone in our organization who can be a Sherpa uh, guiding them along the path uh, at a very difficult time. Thank you. Sounds like a good role for an advocate. All right, we have a motion by Supervisor Simidian. I believe the second was by Supervisor Chavez. Is that correct? Yes, it was. All right, David, may we have a roll call vote, please? Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. And President Wasserman. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you all for what you're doing. It's a, it's a big job, but it's an important one. Thank you. You. We now move on to item number 21. Our County Council James Williams will be presenting regarding the public health crisis of unaddressed behavioral health and substance use treatment needs in the county. James, I'm looking for you. 
because that's what my staff report says. Am I going to Margaret? This, yeah, this is a report back um, from a referral to the board with a resolution uh, declaring public health crisis of unaddressed behavioral health and substance use disorder treatment needs. Uh, I think you. the resolution speaks for itself. Thank but you. if there are any questions, happy to answer them. No, I'm glad to see a resolution that's self-explanatory. We have no members from the public. Vice President Ellenberg. Thank you so much. And thank you, James, and, and to your office for drafting the resolution. It's, it's a good, clear reflection of the yeah. referral and the priorities that have been voiced by all of the members of this board. I, I want to request a, a very minor but important language adjustment in the title and in the second to last statement in the resolution to reflect use of the terms mental health and substance use disorder in place of behavioral health. The latter term is, is just less familiar to the public, and I want us to be very, very clear on the scope of what we are addressing. Is so that something is, that can be done without coming back, without bringing it back to us or delaying? And Vice President Ellenberg, just for clarification, in the title, in the third line, you want to do away with the word behavioral and replace, and replace it, with it mental? Yes, mental okay. health and substance use disorder. Which is already in there. So just change. The yes, word. mental health. Yes, thank you. Just change the word behavioral to mental. Yep. And on the last page, you where in the, where at the end did you want to make a change? In the second to last sentence. In the paragraph that starts with "be it further resolved." At the place where it says again, um, behavioral health. Yeah, I'm looking. I'm looking for that. Is it in the paragraph that starts with be it further resolved that? Oh, and then it's on the sec second line, behavioral gets changed to mental. Mm -hmm. Thank you. James, your response, please. It, those two edits can easily be made. Um, behavioral health was just a reflection of the county's uh, you know, use of the term uh, reflected in its the, the department, uh, but absolutely those that change can be made, no problem. Thank you. Thanks very so much, much, James. I totally understand that, but I'm finding that I'm getting questions of what's behavioral health. And if we are, and for our county, I believe we have changed to that term because it incorporates substance use disorder. But for, you know, for those who are not steeped in the work, spelling out mental health and substance use disorders um, seems to be clearer than behavioral health. Thank you very much. Thank you. So your motion is for acceptance with those two changes. Is that correct? Yes. Yes, Thank it you. is. Supervisor Lee, did I'll you want second. to second and make a comment? You second. Yes, I'll second, and uh, if that's appropriate, I could make a comment. Please. Okay. Thanks, uh, President Wasserman. Uh, first, I would like to reiterate something I did mention on the January 11th uh, when the board passed this uh, referral unanimously. This referral is not simply a verbal declaration. This referral calls for action and action now. I look forward to receiving a work plan and a timeline to be presented to the board by April with any consideration of the funding ahead of the fiscal year 2023 budget. Thank you. Thank you. And James, given the thousand word document and two changes, I think you did a great job. We've got a motion, we have a second, we have no one wishing to speak. Roll call vote. Oh, Supervisor Lee, your hand up. Oh, sorry, um, my bad, but I'm um, ready to vote, thank you. No problem. I don't want to go past, go past anybody. David. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. And President Wasserman. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. We now move on to item 22. We have Consuelo and it looks like Jeff Draper presenting today. Uh, consider recommendations relating to the intent to purchase the property and possible actions are A and B on package page 109. I see Consuelo. Do we have Jeff with you as well, Consuelo? Good afternoon, Board President Wasserman. Uh, I believe it'll just be myself today. All right, take it away. Thank you so much. I wanted to first highlight that this is one of four notice of intents to acquire that you are considering today. The first three were approved on consent. The administration, however, wanted to highlight this specific property in the city of Morgan Hill because it does include a set aside of 30 units for agricultural worker housing. 
And we're uh, making a lot of progress in this area, but it does take some time because it's particularly complex. Um, these four properties will come back to the board on March 22nd for a formal public hearing. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Be happy to make a motion to approve. Do okay. I have a second? Second by Chavez. We have no members of the public wishing to speak. I see no other hands raised. Uh, Dave, roll call vote, please. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. President Wasserman. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Consuelo. We now move on to item number 23, where we should have Martha and is it Emery or M Emery? Martha? There's Emery. Hi. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. This is Martha Wapinski, Deputy County Executive. With me today are Emre Kabai, our CIO, and Nina Diamato, our Director of Information Technology. Thank Given you. the hour, I'm just going to make some brief comments and then we'll, we're all available for questions. So as you know, this responds to a referral from Supervisors Chavez and Ellenberg relating to options for the creation of a county administered municipal broadband service. And you'll recall that during the board discussion on this, the board uh, provided provide additional direction to give consideration to all households, regardless of the location of the county, and then to coordinate these efforts between the Digital Equity, Digital Equity Consortium and our new consultant that I'll talk about in a minute. And then also review the feasibility of public-private partnerships. So just briefly in terms of a broadband master plan, uh, we've entered into a contract with CCT Technologies to prepare the broadband master plan for the county, and they are widely perceived as a subject matter expert in this field. And as I said, we'll be including the Digital Equity Consortium as part of this work. It'll do, the master plan will develop solutions that will meet the community's needs based on access, affordability, devices, and skills. The master plan will be analyzing data to understand our digital equity challenges in the community and develop solutions for unserved and underserved residents. Our estimated completion date for this work is kind of in the uh, October, November timeframe of 2022. We'll be conducting research on access to broadband and the barriers to that access. And it'll, this will help us assess whether a county owned network might be beneficial or not. The consultant will evaluate all available solutions for closing the digital divide in this county. With the scope of work, we did hear the board's um, concerns. And so uh, along with the Digital Equ Equity Consortium and the consultant, we'll be evaluating options for infrastructure solutions within the county, regardless of location. Again, looking at the feasibility of public-private partnerships and leveraging private sector telecommunications infrastructure. We'll also be looking at options for franchising and the feasibility of the Dig One's policy for the county. And finally, with regard to funding availability, all this information is in the report. This is just a high level overview. And while recent federal and state legislation has established or expanded grant programs for broadband, establishing a municipal broadband utility would likely exceed available grant funding and require county funds. And so as part of the work of the consultants in this master plan, it'll include an analysis of available funding streams and provide estimates for any proposed activities um, long-term initiatives and help us devise a strategy. So with those very high level comments, we'll go ahead and, and take questions. Thank you very much. And Supervisor Chavez, Vice President Ellenberg, we have uh, a few members of the public wishing to speak. Do you wish to ask questions before they speak or after? After is fine. After? after. And after, thank you. David, will you please let our speakers in at two minutes each? Certainly, one moment please while we set the timer. The next speaker is Jeremy Barus. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Good afternoon, President Wasserman and the Board of Supervisors. My name is Jeremy Barus. I am the Senior Policy and Organizing Manager at Amigos de Guadalupe Center for Justice and Empowerment. And I am calling in support of the, uh, of the report of, from county staff Access to internet is a human right, and I want to thank Supervisors Chavez and Ellenberg for your initiative in helping families and low-income low communities around the county help themselves to that right. Because of your leadership, Santa Clara County has created a culture where we don't leave anyone behind. 
And in these days that we find ourselves in, we understand this is needed now more than ever. I hope we can include families that we work with in East San Jose, as well as areas all over the county in the digital world with affordable high-speed internet. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Devin Conley. You have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, um, President Wasserman, Vice President Allenberg, and Supervisors. Uh, thank you so much for continuing to move forward towards ensuring that all of our residents here in Santa Clara County have access to the internet. I apologize for the background noise. I am at school pickup right now, um, but that's democracy in action. Um, I, I wanted to urge the county um, staff as well as the board to continue to move as quickly as possible towards developing this broadband master plan and actually securing funding sources in order to take advantage of the state's two billion dollars for last mile projects um, those projects have to be encumbered by june 2023 so there's some real urgency there um, and i want to again just emphasize as the last speaker did internet access is a human right we have seen its impact on students and our families in my own school district here in mountain view Wisman, um, school district I may have failed to mention at the beginning, but I'm also president of the Digital Equity Coalition here in Santa Clara County. And so we look forward to your continued work and partnership. And my little one is here, so I'm gonna go. Thank you. Thank you, that was great. <laughs> Next speaker is Sylvia Leong. You have two minutes, please go ahead. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Sylvia Leong, I'm on the uh, Board of Education for Cupertino Union School District, and I'm speaking in support as well of the plan. Um, as uh, the last speaker, Devin Coley, uh, mentioned, uh, really in order to take advantage of the state's $2 billion, last mile projects must be unencumbered by June 2023. That is why it's imperative that the county proceed as fast as possible with our last mile project to connect our most high needs residents to the last mile broadband. Um, in addition to the $2 billion for the last mile projects, the uh, state is also providing a $750 million loan loss reserve fund to help local governments finance last mile construction. And this is another resource that the county can take advantage of in building its last mile network. Uh, this is another reason why we need to make sure that the county continues to make progress on its last mile network. And just speaking as a trustee, uh, we really believe that this is something that's good for all of our residents, all students, and something that really the county should take the lead on. Thank you. That concludes our request to speak. Thank you very much, but I've got two other requests to speak. Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. Um, I want to th uh, thank the speakers, all of them, and the Digital Equity Coalition in particular. And I wanted to just acknowledge the leadership of Supervisor Ellenberg, uh, both on this issue, on this referral, but even prior to this. Um, and thank my colleagues for unanimously agreeing at the time that that we should, the county should look at being very proactive relative to the digital divide. Just as a reminder, colleagues, there are 70,000 residents who do not have access to internet services at modern speeds. And we have almost, almost 700,000 people who are only served by a single provider. And what that means is that they're really at the mercy of what, what that provider is willing to, um, both willing to provide and at the cost they're willing to provide it. This is really an exciting time for broadband expansion ad advocates and for those seeking of, of us who are interested in closing the digital divide. I am very excited that the CTC technology and energy master plan will meet the moment. And I'm looking forward to reviewing that no later than November, 2022, so that we can be prepared for that June, 2023 um, deadline. I want to reiterate my strong interest for what the board passed in December and that we work toward a municipally owned broadband service provider for the unserved and underserved residents. I absolutely believe that we should be looking at public private partnerships in the in this area where it's most practical. But I, ha I think we have to acknowledge that for 25 years that we have been unable to get the large internet service provider companies interested in providing reliable 
affordable internet to the unserved and underserved populations of our county. It doesn't make business sense for them, and it's hard to believe that it's going to between now and Ju June when this, these products are due. I recognize that this is a long-term major infrastructure project, and I'd like to ask staff to explore as they're doing this, the options that can provide affordable connectivity to at least some of the underserved residents, particularly in rural areas over the next six to 18 months. This may be an area where public-private partnerships are not only appropriate, but necessary. I would like to ask the staff to give us a progress report to the board during the budget process, given that we'll be in hearings together, getting an update on this, particularly given, um, uh, Martha, what you just raised about potential costs for us. I think that might be a good way just to do a check-in. I do, again, wanna thank the staff for this very thoughtful report. Um, Martha, to you, and Emory, to you, and your team. And those are my comments. And with that, I would make a motion. Those thank you for the motion, okay. Vice President Ellenberg. I'll be very glad to second the motion and, and thank you again uh, as well, Supervisor Chavez, for your leadership at the both at the local and the state level um, on, on this work. And thank you, Martha and Imre for the, for the great report. I know that there are many people and agencies and ISPs that are monitoring our work. Um, and I just want to um, emphasize that the analysis that's provided through the master plan should really show authentic engagement with these stakeholders um, and reflect feedback based on, on expertise. As both Supervisor Chavez and, and an earlier caller said, um, reference the state funding, I wanna emphasize as well that because of the influx of state funding for middle mile projects, we're seeing again, uh, counties across the state reviewing options to expand access to currently unserved or underserved areas. Um, I'm hearing right now, um, at, at the National Association of Counties Conference, hearing and reading about numerous options for connectivity, ranging from house-to-house -house broadband wiring, which obviously requires the labor-intensive digging, to fixed-base uh, wireless options that capitalize on unused dark cable and involve much less invasive options, uh, including mounting antennas on public and private structures that provide internet speeds, that are comparable to high-speed direct broadband. I'm in no way recommending uh, one form over another. Absolutely not an expert. I just want to acknowledge that, that there's a, a very wide range of options, and I'm excited to see what comes back both in time for the grant and to make sure that it really is implementable um, in as, as short a time period as necessary, as, as can be done, even if that means phasing, um, kind of like we're doing temporary housing on the way to affordable housing, uh, uh, permanent housing, because that takes longer to build. Are there immediate solutions that are, that are less invasive that we might be able to do more quickly while thinking longer term um, about bigger and, and more permanent feeling investments? So I also look forward to the report back and thank you again for the work. Thank you, Supervisor Lee. Yes, thank you, President Wasserman. Yeah, again, I uh, just want to thank staff for the report back. Um, uh, just a quick question regarding um, an issue that we discussed back in the FGOC meeting in December. Uh, I've requested on the uh, an off-agenda off report uh, regarding the update on the uh, state grant uh, application process. Uh, just would like to ask staff to provide an update of when the off-agenda might be provided. The concern, of course, is making sure that we'll be able to make, meet those uh, deadlines and so many people will be applying for these funds and so only don't want to miss it. We can provide a preliminary status report off agenda within the next couple of weeks, okay. knowing that this is still a work in progress. Great, thank you. And that's all I have. Thank you very much. It was received report, but we did give some direction. We have a motion and a second. So Dave, I'm gonna ask for a vote anyway. Supervisor Lee? Aye. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Samidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. And President Wasserman. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. David, I believe this brings us to our final item, number 24. Do you agree? That is correct, sir. All right. And I'll look for Mr. Key Lee, who's on my screen right now, with Thank a beautiful you. building behind him. 
And we now turn to item 24, report on policing, use of force, and emergency response pol policy reforms. Mr. Lee. Uh, thank you, President Wasserman, Key Lee, Deputy County Executive. Uh, happy to just make a few comments on behalf of the administration and our colleagues in the Office of the Sheriff, County Council, District Attorney, and Public Defender's Office. Uh, this is our fifth report on the 15 recommendations that make up the policing use of force and emergency uh, response policy reforms. Our last report was on August 31st. Uh, in that report, we um, stated that recommendations one through 12 uh, were implemented and completed. Uh, today, I'll focus on, uh, make some verbal comments on recommendations 13, 14, and 15. Uh, recommendation 13 was to consider policies relating to the acquisition of military style equipment. Uh, since our last report, the state enacted AB 481, which uh, creates a state definition of military equipment and a process by which uh, law enforcement agencies uh, must follow um, to obtain approval for use of that uh, equipment. Um, county departments, uh, mainly the sheriff's office, have some existing equipment that meet that definition, and they're working to bring forward uh, the uh, proper recommendations for the board's consideration by May 1st. Um, with the passage of AB 481, we believe uh, that uh, meets the intent of the initial referral. Recommendation 14 was to consider banning or limiting the use of tear, gra tear gas and rubber bullets as crowd control techniques. As the board may recall, uh, the uh, OCLAM uh, made a, a few recommendations and there were some policy disagreements between OCLAM and the sheriff's office. However, since our last report, the state uh, enacted AB 48, uh, the use of less lethal equipment for crowd control purposes. Uh, compliance with those new requirements, uh, we believe resolve the policy disagreements between Oakland and the Sheriff's Office. Uh, and then finally, recommendation 15 was to consider options for restructuring county emergency response to ensure that county employees best trained and suited to handle this given situation uh, uh, were able to do so. Uh, for that, we sort of undertook uh, two strategies. One was county communications implementing uh, emergency police protocols uh, for the dispatch of deputy sheriffs. That has been implemented. The training has been underway. and. Uh, we went live with that on October 5th. Uh, we believe that the uh, Office of County Communications also provided an off agenda report to the fact. Uh, the emergency medical services is also working on, you know, monitoring the uh, implementation of AB 1544, which is designating uh, additional destinations or alternate destinations for local emergency ambulance. Uh, transports. Uh, and then finally, sort of related to all of this is the implementation of a variety of uh, mainly behavioral health uh, programs that uh, are partnerships with law enforcement agencies or alternatives to law enforcement agency response. Uh, we believe that work is uh, important but ongoing. Um, and we believe that uh, all of these sort of meet the intent of the referral. With that, I'll pause and uh, answer any questions. Thank you, Supervisor Simity. Thank you. I uh, I don't think I have questions. I do have a uh, a motion. However, Mr. Chair, if this would be the appropriate time, uh, we have one member of the public to speak. But let's have a motion. Look for a second, then we'll turn to the public. Well, what I would like to do is move the recommended action, which is to receive the report. Um, and indicate that I share staff's view that uh, in addition to items one through 12 having been implemented, 13 and 14 have uh, in effect been uh, implemented by virtue of state legislation, which I uh, appreciate uh, having uh, in support of uh, our efforts uh, previously. That does leave item 15, uh, which is essentially to continue um, identifying opportunities to provide more appropriate responses. Uh, and I think that's where we should be there as well. This is probably an item that will, quote, never be done uh, by its very nature. I would like to ask, I guess I guess I do have a question, if uh, Mr. Janako is uh, available for us from Oaklem, 
whether uh, we might, rather than ask for continued reports on a semi-annual basis, ask uh, our OCLAM contractor, the OIR group, to come back with recommendations on next steps, if any, now that we've made uh, this much uh, progress um, on these 15 items. And I see someone leaning in who I uh, uh, can't, can't recognize, but uh, if there's someone from the OIR group to respond to that question, I would appreciate it. You got it. Do we have somebody here from OIR? Mr. Janako, are you here? President Wasserman, we're looking through the list. It does not appear that Mr. Janako is on this call. All right. Oh, well, Mr. Well, Mr. Lee, anything you can contribute? Um, I can't speak for Mr. Janako, but happy to sort of reach out to him. All right. Well, I'll, I'll make that part of the motion then, which is to not only receive the report and to take the recommended action for item 24, but uh, to say that uh, our uh, semi-annual reports can be reduced to annual reports now just to take a little reporting uh, burden off the staff, but with direction to uh, OCLEM uh, and our OCLEM contractor OIR uh, to come back to us with recommendations, if any, for next steps in this use of force arena uh, sometime in the next three to six months. And that's Thank my you. motion, and I'm looking for a second, obviously. I'll second it. Supervisor Lee, do you have comments before we hear from the public? No, I'll go ahead and let the public speak first. Thank you. All right, so we have a motion and a second. Dave, if you'll please allow the uh, individual wishing to speak. Certainly. One moment, please, while we get the timer up. To do so. Next speaker is Urbish. You have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Thank you very much to uh, Board of Supervisor as well as County staff with regards to the reports. Uh, I think it is important to uh, to address, uh, in particularly within the emergency responses, it is important uh, to require to address the issue and justification for fixing the problem. And also, there ha there has to be a program which prioritizes the the deficiencies that is to be identified uh, within uh, within the system, which basically uh, changes the proposition and progress of the system. When we when we talk about the emergency response, we really need to compare the holistic system and how one system works with the another system. When in terms of uh, uh, providing an emergency response in conjunction with the entire divisions responding to such uh, emergencies. Uh, for uh, for example, in, in particular with the reports, implementation of a bill is a one criteria. However, implementing the bill, Senate and Assembly bill, how that changes the perspective of a health and safety system, regulatory compliance system, property, operation, environment of the entity, conformity to our national standards, and the best practices. If all those five combinations works along with the implementation of holistic system with the assembly bill and Senate bill, then that provides a complete report of what, how the divisional, uh, how the division proposes and works along with the, uh, along with the entire, uh, in terms of emergency response to be provided. So again, I wanted to thank you on emphasizing the report. And again, we want to thank you for a consideration of the comments. Next speaker is P. Sylvia. You have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. P. Sylvia, are you there? That person is not. Hello? Hello? Uh, go ahead. Yes. Yes. Uh, I actually had a quick question regarding the agenda. Item number 41 was not discussed regarding the extension of the contract between the hospital and USEX. We have a few concerns that have not been addressed today. And I'm just, we're just wondering why they've been glossed over. Sure. Mr. Sylvia, if you can wait just a minute. David, please confirm item 41 was approved in consent. That was approved on consent. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That was approved, uh, Mr. Silva Sylvia. Uh, in um, earlier this morning around uh, 10 30. Yep. Did you have any comments regarding this particular item, Mr. Sylvia? Uh, yes, sir. We, a lot of us were concerned were, were emergency physicians who are working 
uh, in this in Santa Clara Valley Emergency Department. And there are multiple issues between you that USEX is uh, uh, had not been able to look like not been able to live up to their end of the contract. Um, yeah, Mr. Sylvia, I, I'm sorry, I need to interrupt you. That was an item that was handled about five hours ago. We're now taking public comment on item number 24, the report on policing and use of force. I'm sorry you missed the item earlier but this is not the appropriate time to talk about that now. Um, it looks right. like that uh, he has um, been muted and not unmuted. So I, it looks like we're done with, uh, with Mr. Sylvia and that concludes our public speakers. Thank you very much. I'll go back, I believe to Mr. Lee right now. Supervisor Lee. Yes, thank you very much. Um, and as uh, earlier mentioned, uh, I believe the recommendation um, 13 was the one um, being uh, 13 was uh, AB, I guess, 481. Is that correct? That was passed uh, by the assembly that yes. is now uh, imposing a public process uh, that the county um, law enforcement agency needs to receive the board approval in terms of the purchase of any future military equipment. Is that correct, um, Ms. Lee? Yes, that is correct, Supervisor. Okay. Now, on recommendation 14 is talking about the banning and limiting the use of tear gas and rubber bullets as a crowd control. Um, the, the enactment, it says of AB 48, was that a typo or was that a different AB I'm, I'm confused about? Uh, th they are two different assembly oh, okay. bills, but <laughs> yeah, one is 481 and 40, 48, yes. Okay, got it. Okay, and that's the one that uh, basically handles that based on the uh, state law of what the prohibition or the additional requirements are going to be. So, okay, good. I just had those a uh, couple of clarification. I just want to say thank you for the, the report and, uh, and monitoring this progress. Obviously, uh, the eight can wait is something that uh, we identified early on and very glad to know that our county has acted expeditiously uh, on making sure that they really can't wait and we're not doing that for sure anymore uh, and all the implementation of the rest of the uh, recommendation. Thank you very much for this. Thank you very much. So we have a motion by Supervisor Smithy and a second by Supervisor Lee. We've heard from the public, no other hands raised. David, roll call vote, please, for number 24. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. And President Wasserman. Aye. Thank you. Supervisors, that concludes our board meeting for today. We will adjourn unless any of you raise your hands and want to make any final comments. Seeing none, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Recording stopped. And with that, this meeting room is being closed. Thank you and have a great day, everyone.